Bodies in bathtubs, murders from the dark web, and entire studios sent to their grave. Japan is home to some of the most deplorable actions ever seen in the modern day world. This is a striking contradiction to the country's extraordinarily low crime rate, which reports a homicide rate of only 0.3 per 100,000 population. However, when things go wrong here, they often manifest in some of the most bizarre, insane, and outright terrifying ways imaginable. So, come join me in this extended session, where we take a look at some of the most crazy stories this amazing country has to offer. Welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at a heavily requested video. By the way, Coffeehouse Crime is all about true crime, strange, and chilling stories, so if that does sound like a kind of thing, please consider subscribing. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is Japan's most disturbing murders. Welcome to Japan, folks. A country that seamlessly blends sacred traditions with cutting-edge technology. From steel monoliths such as Tokyo Tower and the internationally recognized Mount Fuji, all the way down to its 25,000 onsens and hot springs, and more than 100 million sushi eaten per day. Let me tell you, this country will never disappoint you. Much like life and death, Japan's iconic cherry blossoms symbolize fleeting beauty, which thereby reflect the nation's everlasting appreciation for impermanence. Renowned for its precision craftsmanship, culinary artistry, and calm etiquette, Japan's cultural influence seems to extend far beyond its borders. Yet, beneath its rather polite facade lies a complex world grappling with societal pressures and demographic shifts. Pressure that, at times, manifests itself in the most morbid of ways. Our video today begins northwest of Tokyo in Asaka, Japan, and one of those living there was first-year middle school student Anna Sai. Now, Anna isn't actually her real name. Much like the commonly used Western name Jane Doe, it's a placeholder name often used when the true name of a person is either unknown or hidden. Our story today begins in the year 2014, and born in the year 2001, Anna was 13 years old at the time. Not a lot is known about her former childhood or her family, but what is known is that she grew up with both parents by her side in a comfortable home in Osaka. She was described as intelligent and witty for her age, and was also known to be kind and well-behaved. In other words, not one to break the rules or rebel against her parents. Overall, there was really nothing abnormal about her. She was sweet, liked to spend time with her friends, and was well-liked in school. Teachers described her as a clever girl with a very prosperous future. She liked to participate in ballet, and although she was only in her first year of middle school, Anna showed a significant amount of commitment by becoming a member of the student council. Smart, promising, and punctual. These were the three words used to describe Anna. However, in March 2014, that final characteristic would, for want of a better word, disappear. March 10th, 2014. It was a Monday, and the weather was partly cloudy, with a low temperature dipping just below freezing. The time was 3.30pm. School had just finished for the day, and Anna was making her way home via her usual route. Although she was only 13 years old, she was trusted to make it back home safely by herself. You see, in Japan, it is very normal for children to walk home from a very young age. Even without the tradition of trust, Japan is considered a very safe country to live in. Therefore, seeing a young child on their own walking home is nothing out of the ordinary. But when Anna's parents returned home after their own long days at work, Anna was uncharacteristically nowhere to be seen. Searches around the house and calling her name in the garden yielded no response back. And calling her friends and the school was not productive either, as no one had seen her. The Saito family were beginning to panic, and that is when they realized waiting for them in the post box was a letter. It didn't say much, but the handwriting was unmistakably hers, and written inside it said, I'm taking a break from school and home, don't come looking for me. Now, this was highly out of character for Anna. She was a well-behaved young girl who would have never struck out on her own accord like this. Furthermore, if she did actually want to run away from her parents, then why did she leave all her favourite possessions and her essentials behind? None of this made any sense. The Saito family were very quick to report her disappearance to the authorities, and by nightfall, wanted posters were being displayed all across the local area. These posters highlighted that she was likely wearing a school uniform at the time of her disappearance. 
Unfortunately, the authorities didn't have a lot of leads to go on, and although a neighbour was able to confirm that they had seen her that afternoon, it didn't lead to any major breakthroughs. But alarmingly, the neighbour did highlight that she was speaking to a young man outside of her home, which led officers to believe that she was either abducted or had run away with him. But sadly, nothing more came from the sighting, and as the sun rose over Tokyo, Anna's family realised that this was so much more than just a nightmare. Their daughter had vanished without a trace, and there was nothing they could do. Hours soon turned into days, and as those passed, the family were getting increasingly desperate. But on the ninth day of her disappearance, another letter found its way to the Saito family's postbox. And this one read, I'm doing fine. I apologise for causing so much stress, don't look for me. Investigators intervened to analyse the letter's handwriting, and although it was confirmed to belong to Anna, its mannerisms did not match the way in which she spoke. It was therefore theorised that she may have been forced to write this. The stamp on the letter confirmed that it was sent from Chiba Prefecture, located 25 miles east of Tokyo. Local officers were assigned to look into it, but their efforts would ultimately be fruitless. And although the family had hoped to receive another letter from Anna, their hopes would never come to fruition, because after this, Anna would would go radio silent, and just like that, she disappeared. Unknown to the rest of the world, Anna had been abducted by a man named Kabu Terauchi. And Kabu was a very strange and weird man. Born in the year 1992, Kabu was 22 years old at the time of Anna's disappearance. Originally from Aikida, located in Osaka Prefecture, he was raised in a wealthy family. Both parents were successful business owners, with his father owning a security company which specialised in physical home security components. This included things such as door locks, window fences and rails. Now Kabu did very well in high school and was often ranked at the very top of his class. However, he was known to be quiet and didn't have many friends either. And in fact, he seemed to be quite obsessive over particular things, and sometimes came across quite creepy. He was even considered to be somewhat of a hikikomori and an otaku. For reference, Japan refers to hikikomori as a form of severe social withdrawal, characterised by teens and adults who are extreme recluses and are often unable to work or go to school. Otakus are people who are obsessed with particular aspects of pop culture, such as manga and anime, and in Kabu's case, this was anime. Kabu was ultimately very successful with his academics. He attended an aviation school in Tokyo before eventually moving to California, where he obtained his pilot's license from another aviation school. After graduating in September 2013, he then made the move back to Tokyo, where he undertook an engineering degree at Chiba University. While studying here, peers called him quiet, particular, and a little odd. But as far as they knew, he was happy enough. But no one knew of his new, dark, and terrible secret. And from March 2014 onwards, he kept 13-year-old Anna captive in his home. During the days, he would attend classes and see friends as if nothing was happening, before returning to his home in the evenings to focus on his own human experiment. So, before we continue with this story, it may be worth asking ourselves what precisely happened in the lead up to Anna's sudden abduction. Well, it all began about one week prior. Kabu had long desired to abduct and observe a young female student. He wanted to see how her thoughts, behaviour and body would change over time. And furthermore, he wanted to isolate her from society and see how she would react under his own soul influence. He started his plan by searching for the optimal place to find a victim, doing this through an internet-based mapping application very similar to Google Maps. This is how he found a city that fit his criteria, and Asaka seemed to be the perfect place for him to carry out the abduction. It met all of the right conditions, since it was neither countryside nor too urban, and although Kabu was not familiar with the city, he was able to visit it in person and observe it online. Now that a location had been selected, he drove to Osaka to scope the place and its victims out. This is when he came across Anna Saito. He noticed that she often walked home alone from school, and recognised he could use this to his advantage. After following her, he decided to do some investigating, and after looking through the home's placard and various other items around the property, he learned of her actual name. 
It was one week later, on March the 10th, 2014, that he finally decided to kidnap her. It was a Monday, and at around 4pm, Anna was walking home from school. And this is when Kabu approached her from outside of her own home. He tricked her into going with him by falsely telling her that her parents were getting divorced and that he was the family's lawyer. And furthermore, he was willing to take her to both of her parents, who were supposedly waiting at his office. Since Kabu knew Anna's full name, she unfortunately believed him and his story, and therefore agreed to get into his car. However, instead of going to an office, he then drove 40 miles from Osaka to his own home in Chiba. It was at this stage that Kabu had a new and very different story to tell her. He now claimed that her parents were actually planning on killing her. The family were supposedly now in debt, and they wanted to fix this by cutting out her internal organs and selling them on the black market. In addition to this, he presented a forged audio recording to her, which allegedly revealed a discussion between her parents agreeing to such an idea. And this is where the real persuasion and manipulation began. He started to tell Anna that he was the only one who cared for her, and the only one who would protect her. That he was her new saviour, the only one she could rely on. He also told her things such as, nobody is coming for you, nobody cares about you, you've been thrown away, and you're all alone. Over the weeks, months, and then years, this repeated narrative started to become factual in her mind. By the way, this psychological phenomenon is actually quite common, and it even has a name. The illusory truth effect is the tendency to believe false information to be correct after repeated exposure. Repetition makes statements easier to process compared to new unrepeated statements, leading people to believe that the repeated conclusion is more truthful. Now, Anna was in an extremely influential stage of her life. At 13, she was old enough to understand the core workings of the world, but she was still rapidly learning new things within novel environments. She couldn't fully discern what was fact from fiction, and alongside his repetitive rhetoric, she started to believe Kabu. Add the widely known phenomenon of Stockholm Syndrome to the mix, which is a condition where a hostage develops feelings of trust and affection towards their captor, and she was evidently wrapped in a world full of confusion. Her mind was playing a game of psychological warfare for many months and even years after this, and while she recognised that something wasn't quite right about her situation, she stayed put alongside him. Unfortunately, Kabu was busy with his own experiments too. The young man had become obsessed with brainwashing and hallucinogens, and after learning that Morning Glory flowers had hallucinogenic properties, he would frequently spike her drinks with them. Anna was confined to a single room within his apartment, which, as we know, was located 25 miles east of Tokyo in Chiba. The room was heavily guarded by Kabu almost all of the time, and although she was given comforts and conveniences, he made it very hard for her to escape. For example, the bedroom door could only be opened from the outside, and all external windows and patio doors were locked. And, ironically, the iron rails bolted on the outside of his property were actually proprietary to his own father's security business. Now, there were actually multiple occasions where Kabu forgot to close a window or door, and on these occasions, Anna wandered a short distance from the property, only to return before he got back home. Anna did find the courage and strength to escape during one of these ventures, but after approaching her mother and asking her for help, she said she had her own children to look after and shooed Anna away. Trying a second time several weeks later, Anna made her way to a local park where she found an old woman. But, unfortunately, after asking for help, this woman refused and ignored her. Both of these occasions reinforced the narrative that no one cared about Anna, and that, furthermore, she had no better place to be than Kabu's apartment. And although Kabu never found out about her ventures outside, neither did anyone else, with not a single neighbour noticing her exit the apartment or wander around the area. On occasion, Kabu would actually take her outside on small excursions. She sometimes accompanied him for dinner, to a restaurant, or to a supermarket. But she was always unable to escape because she was forced to hold his hand. This highly abnormal and dysfunctional dynamic continued for a large stretch of time. And by February of 2016, Anna Sayoto had been missing for almost two years. The burden and pain her mother and father felt was enormous. It is no secret that a child missing for that length of time is usually indicative of very bad news. But despite 23 months of silence, they still held on to hope. She was still out there somewhere. Both of them could instinctively feel it. And Anna was indeed still alive, although under captivity, with Kabu still watching and observing her. 
In anticipation of his imminent graduation from Chiba University, he made the move from Chiba to an apartment near Higashi Nakano Station found on Tokyo's Nakano Ward. This move was the first one he had made in years, and Anna would go with him. Now, the apartment was nothing special, but it did do its job. Located a few floors up, it had a balcony and a somewhat restricted view of Tokyo. And hey, the bedroom that Anna was kept in even had a door handle this time, which is a very important detail to the next part of our story because that was when, on Sunday, March 27th, 2016, a very sudden and shocking twist in the story occurred. A phone call was made to the Saito residence, and after Anna's mother picked up the receiver, a small voice responded back. It was Anna, and her mother instantly knew it was her. She hadn't heard her daughter's voice for two years, two weeks, and three days. Yet here she was, on the other end of the line. Anna had finally managed to escape from Kabu's home. After being told that he was heading out to Akihabara City to buy a mobile phone, she bided her time and checked the locks. Fortunately, he had forgotten to lock the door, and so, after waiting a few minutes, she grabbed 170 yen from the kitchen, about $1.30 or one pound sterling. After running out of the apartment, she found herself at Tagashi Nakano Station, and after noticing the green public payphones, she made the call back home. Moments later, she called the police. She was wearing sandals and a thin set of clothes, which clearly was not enough to shield against Japan's cold winter. And after recognizing that she was the one in the missing posters, police officers then escorted her to Nitsa police station located in Saitama. And hours later, she was finally reunited with her parents. Miraculously, Anna was in pretty good health and in fairly high spirits, and although she'd spent two years in captivity, fortunately she was not subject to any physical or sexual violence. Now, as far as these stories can go, the conclusion so far had been one of great happiness. Not only was she alive and uninjured, but it seemed as if she was not victim to any abuse either. However, there were other parameters that officers would now have to look at. And unfortunately, it became pretty obvious that her two-year-long experience had greatly and negatively affected her mental health. Anna had developed a severe case of PTSD and anxiety. She was two years behind school, and without dressing it up, had lost two years of her childhood. So although the initial conclusion seemed to be pretty good, the road to recovery would be long and uncertain. Following her escape and the heavy presence of the authorities, Kabu knew he was in a shit ton of trouble, and in a panic, he escaped to the countryside to plan out his next move. He wouldn't get very far though, as at around 3am the next morning, he was finally detained by police officers, after they responded to an emergency call made by a newspaper delivery man. He was found standing in the road with a box cutter covered in blood with a substantial laceration injury to his neck. He eventually admitted that he'd attempted to take his own life by slashing his neck with a box cutter, though with a blade so blunt, all he did was manage to make a mess of it. Kabu was admitted to the hospital, discharged three days later, and then arrested immediately upon exit. After his arrest, Kabu admitted that he'd wanted to carry out a kidnapping ever since his young teenage years while in junior high school. He also admitted that on the night he tried to take his own life, he fled north to the countryside, got drunk on beer and whiskey, and then tried to use the box cutter. Found on the back of a receipt on his being were the words, I committed a terrible crime, therefore suggesting his intention. But as we know, he would not get the results he wanted, and in return for his own life, he would now have to face the courts of Tokyo instead. Now, Kabu had actually graduated from uni just five days before his arrest, but before his trial even began, they would strip him of his degree and all possible merit. Moving into the legal proceedings of this case, Kabu's trial began in August 2017. However, the judge ultimately postponed a ruling after Kabu threw his trial into confusion with some extremely erratic behavior. Kabu made strange noises, spoke unintelligibly, shrieked as he entered the courtroom, and even claimed to be a fairy of the forest. He further claimed that he no longer understood Japanese and was now an amoeba, which is a single cell and often parasitic organism that can invade a host, and sometimes even consume brain tissue. It's not entirely clear if this was an act to appear insane or if he had truly lost the plot. A psychiatric evaluation conducted by the court found that he did in fact have a mild case of autism, but there were otherwise no other conditions they could definitively conclude on. 
Prosecutors claimed that Kabu should be held liable, as the kidnapping and confinement of Anna Saito was deliberately planned and executed. But his defense countered this, arguing that he should not be held responsible for his actions as he was suffering from schizophrenia. The judge, who ultimately ruled the decision, commented that the defendant was aware that his actions were both wrong and illegal, as he made multiple attempts to prevent them from being revealed. One of these attempts included the use of a stolen number plate during the abduction. The judge further said, the confinement lasted for a significantly long period of time, dealing an unimaginable blow to the victim by depriving her of her precious time. The defense argued that Anna's account suggested there was no physical violence or verbal or sexual abuse during her confinement. But Anna's own psychological review was not so positive. It concluded that she had developed a severe case of PTSD as a result of his actions. And even a year after her release, she was still suffering from debilitating flashbacks and was still struggling to readjust to society. She furthermore had severe social issues, struggled to connect to people, and was often too scared to go outside alone. Kabu himself argued that he'd only committed the crime because, quote, the instructions were sent to my brain, and he also said that he was very sorry to the examination subject. When asked why he was calling her that, he said he considered his crime to be an experimentation, and he further added that he wanted to treat her as an animal, not as a human being. On March the 12th, 2018, the Saitama District Court sentenced Kabu Tarauchi to nine years in prison for his role in abducting and imprisoning Anna. But there appeared to be some contention on both sides of this verdict. While the public prosecutors demanded a minimum term of 15 years, Kabu unsurprisingly wanted less and appealed. But the high courts rejected his appeal, and to really rub salt in the wound, in February 2019 they readjusted his sentence to 12 years instead, nullifying the lower court ruling of nine. With his arrest occurring in 2016, he has already served more than half of his sentence behind bars. He is scheduled to be released from prison in the year 2028. In the meanwhile, Anna has moved on with her life, and will be 27 by the time he is released. Anna's father said that, deep down, he believed that eventually she would return home. Seeing her for the first time in two years, his first words to her were, You hung in there. Welcome back. Speaking to the press, her father shared, I am really relieved. I want to spend time with my daughter, so that we can regain the time we've lost. Anna claims that one of the many things which gave her hope was being aware of her parents' efforts and actions throughout the months and years. She had become aware of their activities via the internet, which she frequently had access to while Kabu was out of the apartment. Several articles described her family leading search parties to find her, and her father frequently handing out flyers to the general public. It is unclear what Anna is up to these days, as quite obviously she's trying to hide from the spotlight, but I hope that wherever she is, and whatever she's doing, she's happy and thriving in her environment. Although Anna's case ended relatively peacefully, I unfortunately can't say the same about the next one. This story begins in Aichi Prefecture, and deep in the folds of the dark web. Now, many of us are aware that the dark web can be used for rather illegal activities, but what if I told you that it can also be used for murder? Well, this story highlights one of those moments, and the terrible consequences that followed. And so, without further ado, here is the case of Rie Esagai. Now, despite its ominous sounding name, not all of the dark web is used for illicit purposes. But indeed, it is an area for scammers, fraudsters, and other illegal activity to flourish. And throughout recent years, felonious activity here has become more frequent, more severe, and even more creative. The worst corners of the dark web includes forgery and hacking, illegal pornography, and even murder for hire services. And on August 17th, 2007, amongst this dark virtual world, one fateful message appeared in the forums of one of these hidden websites. I'm looking for a partner in crime, the message read. I just got out of prison. Would anyone else like to work with me in the Tokai region? The ominous message's author went by the username Yamashita, which was a pseudonym used for Yami no Shokuan, roughly translating to the job of darkness in English. And the person behind it was a 40-year-old man who went by the name of Kenji Kawagishi. Kenji was not your typical stand-up citizen. Bullied as a child, due to his ongoing kidney disease, he became a delinquent in Japan society. And although he eventually settled down with a wife and four children after several minor convictions, he would sadly eventually return to the world of illegal activity. In August of 1999, he began to use the dark web to obtain, open, and sell bank accounts, which could then be used for fraudulent activity. Although this brought in extra cash for the family, his spending habits rapidly outweighed this new stream of income. And by 2002, his apartment was ultimately seized due to tax fraud and missing mortgage repayments. Now, unfortunately, 
Unfortunately, Kenji was also allegedly abusive towards his family, yet thankfully his wife didn't put up with his bullshit. She and the kids fled for their safety shortly after these signs started to appear, and eventually the two settled for divorce. But Kenji grew exhausted with his life after this, and between the years 2003 and 2007, he was in and out of prison on several convictions of fraud. Despite these charges, he continued to use the dark web after this, and often moved from job to job, which was usually in transportation or commercial security. At the time of posting his message on the dark web, he had just come out of prison on yet again more fraudulent activity, and was now living out of his car in Isai City. And after reaching out into the unknown world of the dark web, three other men responded. Just a heads up, but we're going to exclude one of them, as eventually he bailed out of the scheme and was never involved in this case. However, the other two were far more guilty. Tsukasa Kanda was a 36-year-old with a similarly troubled history to Kenji. Bullied at school and suffering from chronic headaches, he was also abused by his father. And this volatile and deeply harmful environment led Tsukasa to join local gangs and commit minor crimes. However, eventually, in 1989, he graduated from Takasaki Technical High School. He began to use the dark web in 1997, was convicted of fraud, and then found himself a job at the newspaper company Asahi Shimbun. Allegedly, he often got in trouble with his colleagues and his boss, and his take-home salary was so low that he received weekly pocket money from his girlfriend to support him at the time. And so, similar to Kenji, Sakasa was also in debt and was financially desperate. Yoshitomo Hori, a 32-year-old darts player from the same area, also responded to the message. And although he had no prior criminal history, he was over 4 million yen in debt the equivalent of 30,000 US dollars, or 25,000 pounds. Although there were several other replies to the message on the dark web, Kenji selected these two to work with. And just a few days later, on August 21st, 2007, the three met at Yoshitomo's residence. It is here that they began to formulate a devious scheme to make money. All three men were in crippling debt, and blinded by both panic and greed, they simultaneously expressed a cold disregard for the welfare of others. Their drafts contained several plans, which included pickpocketing, kidnapping, and even a heist against a pachinko parlor, which, by the way, is a type of Japanese casino. The trio tried to conduct one of these plans the next day on August 22nd, and their plan was rather simple. Target a pachinko parlor customer, follow him home, and then abduct him and rob him of his money. However, after tailing his Lexus vehicle, they realized his home was alarmed and he had a dog, and so there was no way they were going to get him. After following another target home the next day, they were very disappointed to realize that he was in a very tight security building, and so, yet again, the heist was called off. The group came closest to making money when they used a stolen credit card to buy a gold necklace at the local Don Quixote. But sadly, or rather not sadly, this also failed. By the way, for those who don't know, Don Quixote is an incredible experience to have when visiting Japan. The buildings are usually massive and sells pretty much everything you can think of, and in a good way, I remember being absolutely overwhelmed when I went there. From instant noodles to underpants, frying pans to dog beds, and Pokemon costumes all the way through to, uh, Tenga eggs. Don Quixote has you covered. It's kind of like a multi-level department store cross treasure hunt, and I bet my bottom dollar that you'll be sure to leave with a suitcase worth of stuff. The place sells really cool stuff, and not even sure why, but when I went on Kyoto I bought 10 of these in like 10 different colours. Kinda cool though, right? Anyway. So it appears that our three men were not having any luck with their plans, and with their failure came both frustration and desperation. And tragically, the very next day, and after upping the ante, their devious schemes would come with some very harrowing consequences. August 24th, 2007. It was a Friday, and at 10pm that evening, young office worker Rie Isagai was walking through the streets of Nagoya to return home from her job. The day was long in the tooth, and with it being a Friday, the working week had overstayed its welcome. Rie worked in the office of a semi-local firm. Most of her tasks were administrative, meaning she was not someone particularly high-ranking in the company but was just as essential to keep it ticking along. Trying to find recognition and reward for her hard work, she stayed late to finish her duties that Friday. And by the time she had almost made it home that night, the streets of Kanagawa were dark and silent. But no worries, she only had a few more corners to walk to make it back to her front door. Looking into her past, Rie had always been a hard-working and thoughtful individual, 
She was born on July 20th, 1976, to her father Suiyoshi and mother Fumiko. Sadly, she was only a child when her father passed away, this tragically leaving both her and her mother to fend for themselves. But through this, the two formed an inseparable bond, and although she dropped out of high school, she impressed her mother by jumping straight into work. To add to this, Rie even held on to the dream of one day buying her mother a house. Rie loved board games. In fact, one of her favourites was called Go, and in her spare time, she often met friends and even made new ones at Go cafes across the city. She was a strong-willed person, yet caring all the same time, and now that she had reached her 30s, she was focused on progressing her career. Which takes us back to the story, to August 24th, 2007. Residing in Komei 2 of Chikusa Ward in Nagoya, Rie used the Higashiyama line to reach her local station at Motoyama. This was part of her usual commute, and once there, she made the one-mile walk back home. It was just past 11pm when she walked past an idle vehicle, and with no reason to be alarmed, she ignored it without giving it any second thought. It was at this moment, though, that the car made a U-turn and discreetly passed by Rie. Peering up, she noticed a man nervously looking around at the buildings, and as she approached him, he turned around to ask her a question politely. I'm looking for the local convenience store. Do you know where I could find it? Rie stopped to answer. However, before she could even answer him, she turned around to see another man lunge at her, and all in the meanwhile, the car she'd spotted before had now hastily parked up next to them. Rie screamed out loud, but nobody in the neighbourhood had heard her, and before she even knew it, she was in the back of their vehicle, a vehicle that was now speeding off into the distance. The consequences of that night were discovered the very next day. A body was found around 35 miles northeast of Nagoya, and in the mountains near Mitsunami. It had been partially buried near a bridge from Route 33, and tragically, this body belonged to Rie Esagai. She was discovered by the authorities just after 7pm, meaning she had been missing for just over 20 hours. Despite being concealed in a remote location, she had been discovered very quickly for a very good reason, because the one to break the news would be none other than one of the killers themselves. Earlier that day, the authorities were greeted with a very concerning phone call, and after picking up the phone, the voice said, I kidnapped a woman, I stole her money, killed her, and then buried her in Gifu Prefecture. As you can likely guess, the three men to abduct and kill Rei Isagai were Kenji, Yoshitomo, and Sukasa, and she'd become their first and only victim from the dark web. After abducting Rei and planning to rob her of all her money, they then murdered her in cold blood, before moving 35 miles out of town and dumping her body. However, it seems like it didn't take long for Kenji's sanity to break, because by sunrise, he had become extremely paranoid. After making the call, he was detained by seven police officers dispatched from the Midori police station, and after being questioned for 15 minutes, he was taken to the mobile investigations unit before leading officers to the site. Now, Kenji was absolutely terrified of capital punishment. However, under Japanese law, he was not allowed to be executed if he surrendered himself first. And so, after his despicable actions, Kenji was left with two options, try to evade the law and risk his life, or give up his free life and guarantee survival. Kenji chose the latter, and in addition to this, he even confessed that he had the help of two other accomplices, and even provided both their names and addresses. Yoshitomo and Sukasa were arrested the very same evening, and just hours later, Rie's body would be formally identified by her mother. Naturally, Fumiko was distraught by the news. Rie was her one and only child, with a father who had died decades before. The entirety of her family had now been lost, and Rie's absence left a massive hole in her heart. She described identifying her daughter's body as an out-of-body experience, and despite her daughter's body's chilling condition, she hugged her tightly through the pain and anguish. Colleagues of Rie were devastated too. They had known her for many years. Not only was she just a colleague, but she was also a friend too. By midnight, the Special Investigations Unit publicly announced Rie Isagai's murder. They further reported that three men had been arrested, and believed that no one else was at risk. Although only one had openly surrendered to the authorities, Kenji, Yoshitomo, and Sakasa all eventually confessed to their crimes. They told investigators that they had met through the dark web, and that the primary motive was greed, to settle their and paid debts. Furthermore, they also confessed that they were willing to do anything to achieve this, which sadly included murder. The details of this crime are particularly saddening. After being abducted, Rie was handcuffed inside the car and driven to a secluded area. The vehicle used to transport her belonged to Kenji, and had been unlawfully obtained through one of 
Canada's former fraud schemes through the dark web. Her bag was looted, which at the time contained 62,000 yen, the equivalent of $450 or £380. She was then further pressed to provide her bank card's PIN number, but unknown to all three of them at the time, she had given them a fake one. Shortly after this, Rie was then suffocated and beaten with a hammer approximately 30 times, and eventually, she heartbreakingly succumbed to her brutal injuries. The three assailants then stopped by a hardware store, purchased two shovels, headed out into the mountainous countryside, and at around 4.30am, dumped her body in mid-tsunami. At around 9am that morning, they tried to withdraw money from her bank account using the pin that Rie had provided them. 2960, or was it 2946, or 2460? Astoundingly, it seems that remembering four simple digits required far too much intelligence for these three men, as all three of them had forgotten what she had said. Despite already showing incredible levels of stupidity, it takes a special kind of stupid to come to the next conclusion. But since they had failed to make any money this time around, all three agreed to meet again later that evening to find another woman to abduct, rob, and murder. However, as we all know, before they could even get there, Kenji's conscience thankfully got the better of him. Following the loss of her daughter, Fumiko made it her mission to punish her three killers just as hard as they had punished her, and within ten days of Rie's death, she had launched a campaign calling for the death penalty for all three men. By the tenth day, she'd received the support of 100,000 people, by October was 150,000, and by December was 318,000 signatures. Not only that, but incredibly, even Yoshitomo's and Kenji's fathers begged the courts for the death penalty. Although single murders rarely face the death penalty in Japan, this case seemed to drum up a lot of anger in the general public. And not only that, but recent trends showed that people favoured stricter punishments. Initial court proceedings began roughly one year later in September 2008, and in this first session, all three admitted to robbing and murdering Rie. They further admitted that things got out of hand when they tried to live up to their boasting online. This is because all three men had claimed that they'd murdered someone in the past, when, in fact, all three were lying to each other. Defense attorneys argued that Kenji, Tsukasa, and Yoshimoto should not be punished with the death penalty because Rie's death was supposedly accidental. They also argued that, historically speaking, all single murder cases usually result in a life sentence and not the death penalty. Now, all three defendants disputed who was the primary assailant and mastermind behind the murder. Kenji insisted that Tsukasa was to blame, and Yoshitomo followed these allegations. But Tsukasa blamed Yoshitomo, claiming that he was the first to strike Rie. There were clear differences in attitudes during these discussions. Although all three men seemed unfazed and emotionless over their actions, Tsukasa often made fun of Rie throughout court proceedings, where Kenji said that the victim was simply unlucky. But on March 18th, 2009, Judgment Day finally arrived. The district court found all three defendants guilty of all charges, and as a result, Tsukasa and Yoshitomo were sentenced to death for their actions. It was ruled that their motives for the crime left no room for leniency, and that capital punishment was the only option, and Kenji was given a life sentence due to his early surrender. Although Rie's mother and ex-partner were both disappointed at Kenji's life being spared, it was widely recognised that a death sentence for Yoshitomo and Sakasa was exceptionally strict when compared to similar cases. As expected, all three men appealed to have their sentences reduced, and while Yoshitomo's death sentence would be reduced to a life sentence, Tsukasa accepted his fate and withdrew his appeal. This resulted in both Yoshitomo and Kenji being spared their lives. However, for Tsukasa, that would not be the same. And on June 25th, 2015, he was executed via hanging. A sad side note to the story, but unknown to Fumiko at the time, Rie had actually been saving more than half her monthly salary to help buy her mother a new home. At the time of her death, she'd saved up more than 8 million yen, which is the equivalent of $59,000 or £50,000. If it wasn't for their forgetfulness, her assailants may have even got their hands on all that money, but thankfully they were too stupid to remember four digits. Regretfully, I see much familiarity between this case and the story of Eve Carson. Both were bright young women with great prosperity ahead of them, and they were both caught up in their day-to-day -day lives when bad luck and merciless tragedy struck. They were targeted, hunted, robbed, and then murdered. And for what exactly? A few measly hundred dollars? The motive behind their deaths is, quite bluntly, almost entirely incomprehensible. An entire life filled with friends, family, partners, love, hope, 
friendship and prosperity, was ended to temporarily fix the financial burden of an irresponsible, low-life individual. The stark level of selfishness is entirely enraging, and now a mother has lost her one and only child. An array of people have lost a good friend, and a young woman has lost her life. To this day, Famiko still gives lectures in various schools and places to talk about her daughter's story. She provides insights into keeping people safe on the streets, and even raises awareness of dangerous online behaviour. While Rie's story definitely was tragic enough, this next one really does push that boundary even further. General disclaimer, but please forgive the audio and the haircut. But the story itself is absolutely wild. Satoshi Umatsu was responsible for 19 deaths and a further 26 injuries. However, it is more the location of this tragedy that makes it so hard to stomach. Today's case is in Sagamihara a city located about 40 kilometers away from Tokyo's central business district. Once used as an area for extensive training by the Imperial Japanese Army back in the 1930s, the city is now better known as an area for manufacturing and industrial production. With an estimated population of 721,000 people, it's now the third most populous city in the Kanagawa Prefecture, placed after Yokohama and Kawasaki and one of the city's residents went by the name of Satoshi Uematsu. Satoshi Uematsu was born on the 20th of January 1990, nearby in Tokyo. His father was an elementary school art teacher, and his mother was a cartoonist. At the age of one, the Uematsu family moved from Tokyo to Sagamihara City, where they settled into their permanent home. Satoshi attended a public elementary school before moving on to a junior high school in the area. At school, he was known to be an entertainer, a charmer, and someone who made other people laugh. He was enthusiastic about basketball, and although his grades weren't excellent, he got by just fine. But it was around this time in high school that Shadows of Doubt first started to cast over Satoshi and his behaviour. On several occasions, he was caught shoplifting with friends. And he was also found to be deliberately causing damage to property while drunk. His most alarming altercation with the law, however, was in 2007, when he allegedly pushed over and hit a disabled person for getting in his way at high school. Despite his questionable actions, Satoshi continued his education into private university. He entered the Faculty of Education to major in primary education, aiming to become an elementary school teacher just like his father. But around this time, his parents suddenly moved out of the Umatsu residence to a condo in Tokyo, leaving the house to Satoshi. And although their motive in moving was never clear, it is speculated that many arguments broke out between Satoshi and his parents, eventually leading to a rift in the family. The supposed breaking point to all of this was around Satoshi's tattoo, which covered most of his back. For those of you that aren't aware, tattoos in Japan are another thing that society looks down upon. The stigma around tattoos dates back as far as 720, when they were used to brand criminals that have committed serious crimes. And during the Edo period in the 1600s through to the late 1800s, tattoos were also adopted by outlaws and gangs such as the Yakuza. They were seen as symbols of courage and loyalty, thanks to their pain and permanence. And while views on tattoos in the modern day climate have relaxed marginally, they are still to this day seen as dirty, disrespectful to family, and shameful. Satoshi finally graduated from university in the year 2012, and although his plans slightly deviated into becoming a full-time tattooist and illegally growing cannabis, he failed at both. Around the middle of 2012, he completed formal qualifications towards social welfare, aimed at qualifying him to work in the psychiatric sector. He passed, and by the time December came around, he found himself a part-time job working at the Sakui Yamayurien care facility also known as Sakui Lily Garden in English. Reportedly, he was hired after telling interviewers that he thought people with disabilities were cute. Satoshi did well in his job, and in April 2013, he was promoted to work full-time at Sakui Lily Garden, eventually being well known as a bright and motivated worker, with plenty of room for growth. But as the months went by, Satoshi's character began to change. In 2014, and again in 2015, Satoshi was caught hitting facility residents. Consequently, he was interviewed by staff several times. 
and vigilance over Satoshi in the workplace escalated throughout the year of 2015. But on the 6th of February 2016, after another altercation, he resigned from working at Sakui Lily Garden, leaving himself unemployed. And while Sakui Lily Garden was glad to see Satoshi leave, it wouldn't be the last time that they'd see him. We're moving over to Tokyo, and the date is the 15th of February 2016, only two weeks since Satoshi's resignation. Satoshi had actually travelled to Tokyo to hand deliver a written letter to the political figure Tadamori Oshima, the Speaker of the House of Representatives of Japan. And this letter was the first big warning sign to Satoshi's behaviour. Satoshi's written letter was a written request, appealing for the legalisation of ending the lives of those with multiple disabilities. He actually pleaded for disabled patients to be euthanised for the good of the world, and warned that he planned to carry out a murderous attack to boost the world economy and prevent World War III. After signing his name, the letter proceeded to detail an offer to target two facilities housing the disabled, and he went on to appeal for certain conditions in exchange for committing his act. Satoshi actually offered to kill people himself. He also added that staff would be tied up to keep them from interfering, but that they would not be harmed. The act would be swift, and after that, he would turn himself in. He ended the letter with, Now is the time to carry out a revolution, and make a tough decision for the sake of all mankind. He then signed it with his name underneath. The letter was handed to Tokyo Police, who then contacted Sagamahara Police. And only four days later, on February the 19th, Satoshi was arrested, questioned, and then involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital. Satoshi's views of disabled people and the crimes he wanted to commit in order to supposedly boost the world economy was nothing short of profoundly immoral. But with him enrolled into a psychiatric hospital, maybe there was now a possibility to unravel and deconstruct his perspective. Tsukui Lily Garden facility was alarmed to hear that their former employee had such views, and so in an effort for protection, 16 cameras were installed across the facility immediately after. But these cameras would only be installed for routine monitoring, rather than for surveillance. And Satoshi's time in rehabilitation would be very short-lived too, because only two weeks later on March the 2nd, he was released by doctors deemed as no threat to society. And that assumption, would be a grave mistake. On the 25th of July 2016, Satoshi travelled to Tokyo by bus to pick up his car from the family residence. He then collected various knives, and afterward, he travelled to a home improvement store where he purchased a hammer and a binding band. Satoshi then travelled to Shinjuku, where he rented a room and dyed his hair golden, before meeting a woman at a barbecue restaurant for dinner. There he told her about his letter and his plans, but tragically, she didn't expect he was actually being real, and ignored it. Fast forward four hours to the morning of the 26th of July 2016. At roughly 1.37am, unmonitored cameras at the Tsukilili Garden Care Facility recorded a black Honda pulling up to a back road. The car belonged to Satoshi Uematsu, who emerged from the driver's seat shortly after parking his car. He walked to the car's boot before pulling out a duffel bag full of knives. He then approached a window located at the southeast wing of the facility and gained entry by breaking it with a hammer. Being a former member, Satoshi knew the area well. Gaining entry from the back allowed him to remain almost entirely unnoticed, and no one heard him break the window either. At 2.10am, he made it inside, found the closest staff member, and tied them up and gagged them. He took their keys, and now with full access to the facility, he was able to go wherever he wanted to. And if his previous letter wasn't obvious enough, there was only one reason why he was here. Satoshi made his way from the southeast corner of the facility, right through to its west end, going from room to room, one by one, tragically using his knives to murder every disabled person he could find. A lot of them were fast asleep in their beds. And when that wasn't enough, he then made his way to the second floor. 
With over three years of experience at the facility, he likely knew the exact process that security officers would follow on a usual night, and so he was able to strategically avoid both them and the security office. With over half of the facility's footprint now covered, Satoshi fled the area through a side door located next to the main entrance, before looping around the main building and back to his car. He was seen again by surveillance cameras at 2.50am, only 40 minutes after his invasion. He then got back into his car, and when he was behind the driver's seat, posted a picture of himself to Twitter, saying, May there be world peace, beautiful Japan. And with his sick fantasy now complete, Satoshi fled the area. Only 10 minutes after fleeing, armed police stormed Sakui Lily Garden. A worker had actually spotted a man with blonde hair wielding a blade walking around the facility's grounds. And when they arrived there, they would discover a harrowing scene. 29 ambulances were sent to the facility, and all of them would be desperately needed. Satoshi wouldn't try to avoid being caught either. In fact, less than two hours after posting to Twitter, he handed himself in to his local police station, along with his bag full of knives. And in the morning, police would find his car too. Blood was found on the steering wheel, with blood-stained towels and plastic bags found on the passenger's seat. A partially eaten piece of bread and 1,000 yen bills were scattered all over. When police questioned him on the letter, he said yes, that was me, before requesting a new identity and plastic surgery after only serving two years in prison. This didn't work, and Satoshi Matsu was immediately arrested on the spot. Back at Sakui Lily Garden, the devastation would continue to unfold. Families of the patients rushed to find out if their relatives were dead. And even those that learned their relatives were alive would have to wait days to find out how bad their relatives' injuries were, or even if they would make it. A total of 19 patients at the facility were sadly killed, most of their bodies discovered in their beds and a further 26 patients were found to be injured, 13 of them severely. At the time of the attack, Satoshi Uematsu was declared as the perpetrator of Japan's worst post-war mass killing, now called to be the Sagamihara Massacre. And later the next day, Satoshi was transferred from the police station where he handed himself in to a high-security prosecutioner's office. Police tried to use a tinted van to conceal his identity, but as he was escorted away, he smiled at all the cameras around him. Police would also raid his family home too, located only a few minutes away from the care facility. There they recovered journals and electronic equipment, and rumours around Satoshi's letter to the government would soon start to spread. But neighbours did express surprise that apparently Satoshi had committed these murders. He was described by them as friendly, outgoing, and a good man. And although some of them did admit that he had changed over the years, no one ever expected him to cause any harm. It was in this moment that a second investigation would begin, looking into the actions and vigilance of police and psychologists who were aware of Satoshi's views. And questions started to circulate around the 16 cameras that were installed in the facility just weeks before the attack. Although they were on and working, therefore recording the entire incident, no one was actually contracted to operate or view these cameras. Both police and the facility failed to react to the warning signs. To add to the frustration, briefings for the families would only begin an entire 10 days after the attack, with information to the health and well-being of the victims being kept in the dark. And the murders of 19 residents at Sakui Lily Garden instantly became international news. In a country that's commonly perceived with very low crime rates, this was a complete shock to many. But one aspect that contrasted greatly between Japan and other countries is that many countries were declaring this to be a hate crime. Japan, on the other hand, with its stigma towards disabled people, failed to report it that way. In fact, not a single Japanese public official ever sought to officially use these words. And to add to this case's disappointment, the victims of the Sagamahara massacre were never officially named either. 
This wasn't out of respect, but instead was because the majority of the families didn't want the public to know that their loved ones had disabilities. And on the surface, while this move can be seen as a way of protecting their privacy, it could also be a way of keeping people with disabilities out of the public's eye. We're moving forward to Satoshi's prosecution. On the 20th of February 2017, seven months after the attack, Satoshi was officially found mentally competent to stand trial. This paved the way for more severe charges if found guilty. And with Japan accepting the death penalty on severe cases, emotions around Satoshi's fate were high. His defence team said that they were planning to argue that he was mentally incompetent at the time of the crime, due to the effects of marijuana. And almost three years later, on the 8th of January 2020, Satoshi would face trial. He pleaded not guilty to the stabbings, however. Over 2,000 people lined up outside the courtroom to try and get one of the 26 viewing seats in the public gallery, while media broadcasted from outside. During trial, at no point did Satoshi show any remorse for his actions to the victims. He did, however, admit that he was sorry to the families, before proceeding to bite a part of his own finger off as an act of apology. The stunt failed to mean anything though, as he continued to insist that there was no point in disabled people living. After an agonising long trial, the verdict was finally made. Satoshi was formally found guilty, with 19 counts of murder, 24 counts of attempted murder, 2 counts of illegal confinement causing injury, 3 counts of illegal confinement, 1 count of unlawful entry, and 1 count of violating the Swords and Firearms Control Law. The prosecution then announced that they were seeking the death penalty, calling his rampage inhumane that left no room for leniency. And on the 16th of March 2020, Satoshi was officially given his sentence to death by the Yokohama District Court. To the date of this video being recorded, Satoshi Umatsu is still alive and in prison. He awaits to be executed from a high security prison cell. When that day will come, however, nobody quite knows, with the effects of the pandemic delaying the process several times. And while I wish I could go into remembrance for the 19 victims of Saku Lily Garden, sadly, I can't, because they have no names and no faces. Take this as a personal feeling, but denying their names and faces is like denying them their humanity. Following other tragic stories from around the world, we remember the victims, what they were like, and what defined them. And through that, their remembrance puts a heavy emptiness to a place that was taken by a killer. Brushing who the victims are away strips them of their worth, and in turn suppresses the attention that's given towards a case. There were no charities on news articles, no hashtags on Twitter, no campaigns on GoFundMe, and the story itself quietened down all too quickly. And while the will of the victims' family members should be respected, the stigma and shame around disabled people in Japan should not be ignored. It's a bias that tragically played a heavy part to this case. Following Satoshi's crime, both Japan and the rest of the world have become more aware of their perceptions towards people with disabilities. But whether Japan will learn from this, and from its disturbing past, is still yet to be seen. With the Paralympics Games currently set to be performed in Tokyo later this year, opportunities to normalise and improve on perceptions over disabilities are aplenty. So let's see where they go from here. And back in Sagamihara, families and friends still pay tribute to the victims. They lay flowers once a month outside the facility, which was demolished and rebuilt in 2016. And although some of the victims' names and faces have finally been revealed, most are still kept in the dark. Hopefully one day, this type of stigma and discrimination against disabled people will finally cease to exist, and maybe even the case of Satoshi Uematsu will become a vital lesson that was learned along the way. While most of Japan's dark stories are quite understandably written by Japanese residents, our next one comes from the deplorable actions of an American Marine. In fact, this case caused quite the stir between American and Japanese authorities. So, without any further ado, let's travel south of Japan's mainland to the island of Okinawa. Now, I've always said that Japan as a country is extremely diverse when it comes to climate. And perhaps not many of you know this, 
but northern Japan actually has the highest snowfall per year when compared to any other country. Today's video looks at the stark opposite of this, as Okinawa is Japan's version of tropical paradise. It's a popular destination for Japanese natives looking to catch some sun, waves, and warmth. And sandy beaches and a laid-back atmosphere to the island is what makes Okinawa special. Okinawa is classed as its own prefecture, but has a relatively small population. It's also a destination that has a heavy western influence, from its beach culture to its local delicacies. And strangely, Spam is a very common food to be found in Okinawan cuisine, even in sushi. There's great reason for western influence in Okinawa, as 25% of the island is actually covered by military bases from the United States. It's no secret that the local people of Okinawa are uneasy with this arrangement, as 60% of their small 460 square meter island is consumed by its military presence. This has been a point of contention between the US and Japan since World War II. But otherwise, Okinawa is a laid-back island with a vibrant culture and wonderful people. And it's here, on this island in Uruma City, that we find 20-year-old Rina Shimabukuro. Rina lived in a small two-bedroom apartment. She was a hard-working employee in a corporate office, which at her age was rather admirable. For the most part, she was independent, and she was a very self-driven young woman. She was admired in the workplace and by those around her for a positive yet sensible attitude towards life. Rina grew up as an only child, mostly keeping to herself, but liked by those around her for a polite personality. She was also known to break out some impressive dancing and singing skills when around those she was most comfortable with. While growing up, Rina always desired to have siblings to share her passions with. And so, as she became older, one of Rina's main ambitions was to have children, telling her friends that she was aiming to have around six of them. And this opportunity may have come sooner than expected, as in 2015, Rina began a relationship with a local Okinawan man. Due to the nature of Japanese media and identity protection, we don't know the name of this man, so for the sake of this story, we will call him Hinata. What we do know about Hinata is he was an attentive and respectful partner, and he treated Rina well. We know this, as Rina's new boyfriend quickly gained her parents' approval, something which often makes or breaks a relationship in Japan. Things were going so well between the two that eventually they moved in together, getting an apartment in Uruma City. And settling into their everyday lives, they slipped into a routine. Rina and Hinata would work on the weekdays to cherish their moments together on the weekends. In the following months, the couple described their relationship as happy and content, and this routine would carry them for several months more. Until all of a sudden, tragedy would blindside their peace in April of 2016. On a mild spring evening, Rina decided to head out for a walk. It had been a long day sitting in the office, and so she figured she would go out to stretch her legs. At around 8pm that evening, just before dusk, she slipped into her red sneakers and a black parka before shutting the door behind her. Rina kept in regular contact with her boyfriend through the messaging app Line, which is the most popular way to talk by text in Japan, much akin to WhatsApp in the West. She messaged her boyfriend to say that she was going out for a walk and would be back later on in the evening, which was nothing out of the ordinary. Taking her usual route along the edge of a canal, she took in the evening's calming sights. Reflections in the water displaying illuminations of apartment buildings, commercial stores, restaurants, and even a mega Don Quixote. On the other side of this canal was an industrial sector full of factories, warehouses, and shipping companies, all of which were busily working their way into the night. Rina had walked here many times after work, she felt safe here, and rightfully so. And this very night, Hinata was waiting back at home for her to return. But as the hours passed by and the clock hit midnight, the incessant feeling of worry began to haunt the young man's mind. Rina did like her own space, so at 2am he sent her a single text message to say he was signing off for the night, which after a few minutes was marked as red. Surely this meant she was okay. Maybe she had bumped into a friend and wanted some time to catch up. After all, in Japan, it's very common for couples to keep their feelings to themselves. And so, Hinata went to bed, expecting to see or hear from Rina in the morning. Maybe then they could catch up and talk about where she had been over the evening. But as the morning arrived, there was still no sign of Rina anywhere. She hadn't returned home or replied to his message, despite this message being marked as red. This didn't sit right with Hinata. And so, on the morning of April the 29th, he contacted local police to report his girlfriend, Rina Shimabukuro, as missing. Police were rather quick to arrive at the residence, and while there they began their investigations, asking Rina's boyfriend as much information as they could. In parallel to this, Rina's group of friends immediately took to social media, asking around for their missing friend. And soon enough, speculation started to spread like wildfire around the tight-knit community. 
As time clambered by, multiple theories arose. Some believed it was a random abduction, some believed the boyfriend had something to do with it, while others speculated cult activity. And as all this heresy plagued Rena's disappearance, the police released multiple images to the public in hopes that someone would come forward with a lead. However, as these first few days passed by without any notion or clue, concern and dread began to fill the hearts and minds of Rena's family, friends, and boyfriend. During public campaigning, police were still working hard behind the scenes. Eventually, they discovered where Rena's cell phone had last pinged in the moment she read her boyfriend's final text message for the night, which just so happened to be in the early morning hours of 2am. It turns out that a cell phone had pinged one final time while inside the industrial estate located next to the canal. This was a critical piece of information for officers, as now they could question those working around the site and start to scour the area for any clues or evidence. It was through these efforts that they spotted something peculiar on a surveillance camera, which happened to be owned by one of the industrial companies. On the very same night Rena disappeared, a red SUV seemed to be acting rather strangely. And upon further investigation, they discovered that the SUV belonged to a US military serviceman stationed in Okinawa, and more specifically, at the Kadena Air Base. The car was owned by a man named Kenneth Shinzato, and he was a 32-year-old US Marine stationed on the island. Back at home, Kenneth was born and raised in New York by a single mother, Shirley Gadsden, and although Shirley did her best to raise him, she was ultimately ill-equipped to care for the young boy. Kenneth was a problem child while growing up. He was disruptive at school, had regular temper tantrums, and often fought against his mother. In fact, this behavior got so bad that Shirley ended up taking Kenneth to therapy. Paperwork from the Upper Manhattan Mental Health Center described Shirley as cognitively limited, and declared that the two had a tangled and enmeshed relationship which made his treatment extremely difficult. Ultimately, Kenneth was put into foster care in 1997 at the young age of 11, and from here he went through a total of five foster families due to his behavior. At the age of 18, Kenneth moved into his own place near his mother's home until eventually he joined the Marines. He served in the Marines for seven begrudging years, before taking a back seat in 2014 by accepting support work for the Marines in Japan instead of moving back to the US. And the reason for this was very understandable. Meeting and falling in love with a Japanese woman, the two eventually married and Kenneth had even taken her last name to distance himself from his own mother. The two would also have a newborn son in March of 2016. And although his wife had urged him to tell his mother, this never actually occurred. Which brings us to May of 2016, only two months since the birth of his own son. This was when Kenneth's car was spotted on cameras around the same area and time where Rena disappeared. So why was he here? Did he have anything to do with it? And what was the reasoning for his suspicious behavior? Kenneth immediately piqued their curiosity, but when he came in for questioning on May the 16th, he denied any involvement, and he answered all questions to an acceptable standard. However, they did seize Kenneth's car in an effort to conduct their own forensic analysis, but the results for this would take several days to come back. And so, with that said, Kenneth was released from police custody, as there was no evidence to suggest he was involved in Rena's disappearance. You'd expect that, under normal circumstances, he would return home to his family, but that is not what Kenneth had in mind. Instead, he made his way to a local drugstore, purchased an extortionate amount of sleeping pills, and purchased a two-litre bottle of whiskey. And you can probably guess what his plans were. The next morning, Kenneth attempted to take his own life, but after ultimately failing, he was admitted to his local hospital. Unfortunately, it gets worse, as the very next day after being released, he was once again rushed to hospital after downing two more bottles of whiskey in one evening. This behavior is reactionary to his situation. Whether it was from guilt or fear, Kenneth wanted out of whatever scenario he was slowly falling into, and this was by any means necessary. Just one day after Kenneth's second overdose on alcohol, Results from the tests conducted on his vehicle had finally come back. DNA found inside his car had been compared to DNA found in Rena's home, and unfortunate for him, the tests were conclusive. A match was found. This at least confirms to investigators that Rena Shimabukuro had at some point been inside Kenneth's vehicle, and most likely on the very night she had disappeared. This undeniable proof seemed to overburden him, because as soon as interrogations began, Kenneth finally buckled. He admitted his part in Rena's disappearance, and even worse, he told officers where they could find her. Leading investigators to a small and sad wooded area in Honor Village, officers came to a black suitcase. Like a meaningless object, it had been thrown off the side of a road discarded into the woodland underbrush, and inside lay the decaying body of a young woman. Being here for more than 20 days in the searing Okinawan heat, 
she was unrecognisable and partially skeletonized. DNA testing later confirmed her identity, and tragically, it was the body of Rina Shimabukuro. The community at large were devastated. As we can all imagine, they had hoped to find Rina alive and well. But sadly, these hopes were now crushed. With the discovery of Rina's body, Kenneth felt no reason to withhold information from authorities for any longer, and instead, he gave his version of the events which unfolded on the 28th of April 2016. It was on this evening, when Kenneth was driving around Urma, that he spotted a small five-foot frame walking alone in the dusky hours. You see, Kenneth claims that he'd always fantasised about dark things, even as early as childhood. Rather disgustingly, he fantasised about forcing himself onto women, murdering them, and even taking his own life. And to take things one step further, he also fantasised about killing his mother and even causing mass tragedy. In fact, his reasoning for joining the military was out of the expectation that he could kill other people. Abducting and restraining women before carrying out his desires was a long-running fantasy of his. And on the night that he saw Rena, the situation was perfect. She was small, alone, in a quiet area, and had the means of kidnap at his disposal. Almost as if it was planned, or in Kenneth's eyes, fate. Kenneth pulled up on the nearby road and pursued the woman on foot, before coming up behind her and striking her over the head with a metal rod. Kenneth grabbed her, dragged her to a nearby area, and then assaulted her. But Rena was not fully unconscious, she began to resist Kenneth, fight back, and even call for help. This was when Kenneth pulled his arm back, and began to physically fight the defenceless woman. And after pulling out his knife, he stabbed her multiple times, until eventually, Rena was no more. Kenneth retreated to his car, pulled out a black suitcase, loaded his victim inside the suitcase, placed it into the back of his SUV, and drove off into the night. And after driving 20 kilometers or 12 miles from Uruma to Oma village, he stopped on the side of a quiet road, throwing the suitcase as far as he could into the underbrush. This is where Rena would stay for 22 long days. Acting as if nothing had happened, Kenneth then retreated back to his car, and drove back home to his wife and newly born son. In the following days, Kenneth was waiting for expectation for police to come knocking at his door. But as the days and then weeks passed, his confidence grew. He resumed his normal life, starting to believe that he may have gotten away with his crime. However, as we all know, this was not the case. And soon after, he was to face the full force of the law. Rena's murder brought a lot of attention towards US military presence on the island, and as the years go by, there's a notably growing amount of crimes that are being committed by US personnel. This contention began in 1995, when three US Marines kidnapped and sexually assaulted a 12-year-old girl. And since then, Okinawa has debated hosting the US military. The murder of Rina Shimabukuro wasn't only a fresh reminder to this notion, it was a very strong one at that, and Kenneth's actions actually brought thousands of residents out to the streets in protest. This is not how we want the country to be. We are your friends, your neighbors, but we want base to be gone. Before court, Kenneth insisted he did not intend to kill Rena, and apparently his only aim was assault. Throughout his trial, Kenneth was reserved, quiet, and often staring into space. Both judge and jury did not buy his story, and instead they determined that all of it was premeditated. It was noted that Kenneth had bought his own murder kit out with him late at night, including a baton, an empty suitcase, and a knife. And if his aim was only to assault, then why were these items in his car? His actions on this night did not reflect those of someone who did not have intention to kill. While being charged with murder, sexual assault, and illegal disposal of a body, Kenneth would plead guilty to sexual assault resulting in death and abandoning a body, but denied his charge of murder. And with Rena's parents calling for the death penalty, Kenneth had every reason to worry. Fortunate for him, but this sentence would never come his way. And instead, Judge Toshihiro Shibata would give him life in prison, stating there was no room for leniency in such a violent and unnecessary crime. Nobody can deny that Kenneth's actions that night were selfish and despicable, and his evil actions cannot be defended. Perhaps his resentment towards women can be spurred from an internal hate towards his mother. Then again, his wife never complained of any ill behaviour towards her, and neighbours always said that the couple were kind and happy. So, what made Rena different from any other woman in his life? And what led him to choose her on that lonely, fateful night? Unfortunately, we will never quite know. 
Rena was a young woman who had just entered a true adulthood. She was planning her future, her marriage, and her family. She was kind, patient, and loving towards those around her, and especially towards her boyfriend, who misses her dearly. Rena was positive, sensible, polite, and nurturing. Characteristics which you could argue are the total opposite to her killer. And tragically, her dreams were stripped away from her by a disturbed stranger. She wasn't given a chance, all by the actions of one individual. Our next case takes us to Kawasaki, and is the perfect example of the butterfly effect, for all of the wrong reasons. Now I think we're all aware that actions can cause reactions, and while some of them may be intentional, the reality is that most are actually without any intent whatsoever. So, when one man decided to go on a murderous spree, he was surprised to learn that his actions caused another murder only a few days later. Japan tends to be well associated with futuristic and modern inventions, such as robots, bullet trains, video games, and of course anime and manga. And in fact, if you walk around the streets of Tokyo, you'd be hard done by not to spot some kind of anime or manga character, or even just a cute little mascot within your view. From their train networks hosting them all over their carriages, to convenience stores and even airports having their own mascots and media sponsors. The nation of Japan is engrossed in fictional characters and their own little worlds. Anime and manga in particular have made the mark across the world all over, gripping the interests of people both young young and old. However, and this tends to be one of my most favourite sayings, but everything in moderation, right? People can sometimes get a little too engrossed in fiction, some even neglecting their real lives in favour of the imaginary world. And those that do this can simultaneously try to escape existence in society. Of course, you have probably guessed what I'm talking about here, and that is the world of hikikomori. But what are hikikomori exactly? And why is being one seen as such a negative label in Japanese society? Simply put, Hikikomori are categorized as so-called shut-ins, people who rarely leave the house and despise interacting with others. In the Western world, you could probably call them hermits, extreme introverts, or agoraphobes, people with a genuine fear of going outside and being in public spaces. Hikikomori can also be seen as a NEAT, that's N-double-E-T, which stands for not an education, employment, or training. So basically, that's someone who doesn't contribute to society in any distinct or useful way. These social shut-ins are often looked at negatively by wider society, especially in a country like Japan, where there is a strong sense of honour that comes from working and supporting yourself, your family, and the wider economy. And amongst these recluses of society, in the city of Kawasaki, just south of Tokyo, we find 51-year-old Ryuichi Iwasaki. Ryuichi was born in December 1967, and despite his parents being together at the time of his birth, this wouldn't last for long. They divorced when he was only four years old, and as a result, he went to go and live solely with his father, rarely seeing his mother. However, this situation would not be stable either, and Ryuichi would eventually move in with his extended family in a crowded house consisting of his grandparents aunt, uncle, and cousins. During his childhood, he was enrolled in Caritas Elementary School before graduating to junior high, and eventually progressed to a vocational training school where he studied engineering. Ryuichi led a relatively normal life, though he did struggle to maintain friendships during his school years. He was otherwise stress-free, and following his graduation, he worked in several basic jobs, mainly factory work and as a night guard for a local store. But throughout the years, and while his cousins moved out and got on with their own life, Ryuichi continued to live in the family home. His grandparents sadly passed away in 1990, thus leaving him with just his aunt and his uncle. As Ryuichi moved into his 40s, he found himself spending more and more time at home alone, which, as you can imagine, may sometimes result in depression. But the lack of comfort didn't end there, sadly. He had also recently lost his job, and with no rent or mortgage to pay, he made no effort to find re-employment. Although Ryuichi's aunt and uncle were often out of the house, doing their own things, such as work and their own hobbies, they still did their best to look after to him. I mean, they practically babysat him. His meals were cooked, his clothes were washed, and the bills were always paid. However, despite this, he always did his best to avoid going outside. As the years passed by, so did their birthdays. The couple were slowly growing old, and with all of the love and support that they gave their nephew, they hoped that, one day, he would return the favour. However, as they would eventually find out, Ryuichi was becoming very selfish in his 40s, and by the year 2010, he'd abandoned all efforts of becoming a functioning member of society. Instead, he spent every waking moment in his own room, playing video games and watching manga while trying to avoid any contact to the outside world. And sadly, this included his own family. 
Despite their nephew's presence, the aging couple was so desperate for care that they eventually asked the local welfare centre for home care visits. However, due to Ryuichi living at the property, they were instead advised to speak to him for help. Soon after this, they asked him to do his own housework, and in the month of January 2019, they left a note outside of his bedroom door, the note explaining their dilemma and begging him for his help. However, Ryuichi didn't take their message very well. Instead, he confronted them, saying, I do my own meals, laundry, and other things myself. What do you mean I'm withdrawn? The now 51-year-old Ryuichi had become entirely comfortable in his unemployed and secluded life, and having been in this situation for decades now, he had gained a strong sense of entitlement to his easy lifestyle. Neighbours would also complain about his behaviour. One notable instance occurred in the summer of 2018, when the neighbour's tree branch was slightly hanging over the adjoining fence. After realising this, Ryuichi furiously knocked on their door, insulting them and commencing an hour-long argument. By now, it was obvious that he had become semi-feral and furious with the world. He despised his uncle and aunt for making him feel useless, even though, deep down, he knew that he actually was. The man no longer fit in with society. However, very little did anyone know that this sentiment would manifest itself in one of the most terrible of ways. May the 28th, 2019. At roughly 7am that morning, Ryuichi did something entirely out of the ordinary. He got up early and left the house for the first time in several weeks. Stranger still, he wished his neighbours a good day on the way out. Meanwhile, a short train ride away, things were typical for a morning at Noborito Station. Commuters were busily making their way to work, while local children were heading off to school. It is not unusual for even young children to travel to school alone. Alongside Norway and Switzerland, it has one of the lowest crime rates per capita, and I know what some of you are going to say, yes, that's at least what they record. At 7.44am on this day, a crowd of people, mainly children, were waiting for their shuttle buses to arrive, one of which was a bus to Karita's elementary school, the very same school that Ryuichi had studied many years previously. Speaking of Ryuichi, it was in this moment that he arrived, however, he was not there to get in line for a bus. Brandishing a knife from his jacket, Ryuichi began his attack at the back of the waiting line and after attacking a male adult, he ran towards the crowd of children and parents. He proceeded by lacerating a mother, before cruelly turning the knife on the youngest of the bunch. And as a bus unexpectedly pulled up to the commotion, its driver looked on in shock and horror, unable to comprehend what he was witnessing. But Ryuichi's spree ended almost as soon as it began, because as the crowd frantically dispersed, Ryuichi walked 10 meters before then turning the knife on himself, an action that ended in him taking his own life. Just a mere 10 seconds Seconds later, the whole ordeal was over, and Ryuichi collapsed to the floor. Within half a minute, Ryuichi had caused a severe amount of physical damage to a total of 19 people. This included two adults and 17 children. By the time emergency services arrived, two of those had sadly passed away this including a 39-year-old man and a 6th grade student. Due to the large number of victims, a total of 11 ambulances were called to the scene, where four people were considered to be in critical condition, this including Ryuichi. Now, thankfully, all three of those innocent victims would recover from their injuries, whereas Ryuichi himself would pass away from his own self-inflicted stab wounds. After searching around the crime scene, officers found four knives on his body, this including two fishing knives and two knives in his backpack, one of which being more than 25 centimeters long. A second backpack containing a sashimi knife was found at a local convenience store, therefore indicating that Ryuichi planned to return and cause further bloodshed. It was further learned that most of these knives were purchased several months prior, therefore suggesting that he'd planned these attacks for quite some time. However, despite all of the evidence available, we will likely never know the real motive behind Ryuichi's actions. We can only assume that the man was so depressed and helpless that he came to the conclusion that he no longer wanted to exist. And with so much angst and hate towards the world, he planned to depart it with the most inflicted devastation possible. It is often noted that people who commit these mass public atrocities do not intend to come out of it alive. Japan has, unfortunately, seen a number of these mass killings in recent years. Some of you will remember that I've covered a few already, including the Kyoto Anime Massacre. 
These people feel that they have nothing left to lose, yet all the same harbour such a high degree of hate towards the world that they feel the need to punish all of those around them. Take Elliot Roger for example. The young man knew that he wanted to end his own life. He never questioned his depression or his own faults. Instead, he blamed the so-called stupidity of women and frat boys, and in the end, his target was none other than a sorority house. Similarly, Elliot was a recluse set against the world, isolated from society. Isolation can simulate a severely negative toll on one's mental health, and it's obvious that this sort of problem extends past American borders and into other societies such as Japan. The post-incident response to this case is extremely telling of that. Hikikomori are so prevalent in Japan that they even have their own websites, communities and events. And after Ryuichi's crime, the head of Hikikomori UX conference released a statement to say that this crime should not be linked to their lifestyle and that they should not all be thought of as potential criminals. However, this would not stop the Japanese media from sensationalizing the situation as such. So much so that those living with current shut-ins began to feel fear that their reclusive friends and loved ones would be the next to commit such heinous crimes. In the days and weeks after his actions, the whole country was in shock, and the face of Ryuichi Chiyosaki spread quickly throughout the media, alongside the newly tainted reputation of those within the Hikikomori community. And one person to hear the news was 76-year-old Hideaki Kumazawa, who just so happened to be the former Vice Minister for Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. The details about the news reminded him of his own son, who was 44-year-old Iachiro. Unfortunately, he had recently moved back in with his parents, due to his repeated failure in finding a job. While growing up, Ichiro was considered to be gifted in elementary school. He was placed in private education by his resoundingly successful father. But after moving into junior high, his grades would suddenly begin to disappoint. Most notably, he didn't quite meet his mother's expectations, who, unfortunately, was particularly strict with her son throughout his childhood. If he didn't achieve the grades that she desired, she would take away his toys and belongings, even sometimes destroying them right in front of his eyes. Now, this animosity at home was reflected in Aitro's behaviour in school. According to previous classmates, he was that obsessive weird kid who always spoke to himself. Apparently, he was very much the type of person to hyperfixate on things, and was very obsessed with video games and anime, often losing himself in those fictional worlds. Rather than pay attention in class, he would instead draw the characters he was obsessing over, and back at home, he would lock himself in his room and play video games all night. This continued into his adulthood, when he then grew a strong addiction to the video game Dragon Quest X. It became obvious by now that this was Aitro's preferred method of communication, connecting with other people through a keyboard and mouse rather than through real life. This sort of behaviour caused significant animosity among the family. But although Ichiro's mother could easily take control of her son as a child, he was now getting older, and therefore stronger in both physical strength and strength of mind. And after his second year of junior high, Ichiro began to intimidate and sometimes even hit her when she upset him, which, as you can imagine, caused much grief within the family. Unknown to them at the time, but Ichiro was actually actually displaying all the telltale signs of autism. However, developmental disorders are a somewhat controversial topic in Japan, and he would only be diagnosed several decades too late. This delayed diagnosis also explained his social issues, and his tendency to hyperfixate on specific things. These tendencies would also transition into his adult life. Iuchiro didn't want to follow the path of his father, no matter how much his mother tried to push him towards it. Instead, Iuchiro followed his heart and passion, and wanted to get a job in the anime and manga industry. His parents would continue to push him to go to a standard college. But after failing his entrance exams, he instead enrolled at Yoyogi Animation Academy. Graduating with a degree in computer graphics a few years later, he was thrust into the world of working, where he would sadly ultimately fail again. Unable to secure a new job, his father used his connections to find work at a hospital, and although this would allow him to move out of the family home, the apartment he ended up living in was still owned by his mother. So, if it's not abundantly clear by now, Eiichiro unfortunately did not have the mental means to support himself, and in his adult life, he became increasingly reclusive as the years passed by. He would continue to sit indoors, watch anime, play video games, and spend way too much time online. In fact, found on his Twitter account, he even boasted that he logged into Dragon Quest Online every day since it was released, which, by that time, was almost seven years ago. As a result of his reclusive behaviour and mental challenges, he eventually lost his job, 
of course in Japan society, bringing shame and disappointment to his family. Without a job, Aichiro could no longer afford to live alone, and so in May of 2019, and at the age of 44, he moved back in with his parents. His behaviour plummeted almost instantly, and it's reported that he became depressed, was embarrassed with his life, and even lashed out at his family. And naturally, both his mother and his father were rather nervous about his violent outbursts. Add disappointment to the mix, and it's quite obvious why they didn't really appreciate his company. Hikikomori had a bad enough reputation by now, and unfortunately, Eiichiro was beginning to fit that label perfectly. And then, only one week after moving back in with his parents, the Kawasaki stabbings occurred. Talk of Hikikomori flooded Japan's headlines, and one of those to hear of the news, of course, was Eiichiro's father, Hideaki Kumazawa. It was at that moment that Hideaki made a terribly flawed connection. The old man was beginning to see his son in Ryuichi Iwasaki. In his eyes, someone just just like his own boy, had just committed terrible atrocities, all supposedly due to his anger and a lack of social interaction. Both Ryuichi and Iichiro, they were both Hikikomori and both capable of violence. Aichiro himself had proven that he was capable of causing harm to other people, and Hideaki's worry and fear for his own safety would come to a peak on June the 1st, 2019. It was another average day in the Kamazawa household. Hideaki's wife was out working, while Eichiro was in his room playing Dragon Quest Online. Meanwhile, adjacent to their home, the local school was busy hosting an athletics event, with cheering heard throughout the entire neighbourhood. The cheering seemed to bother Eichiro, however, and with his growing irritation, his anger once again manifested itself. He began to shout at his father, starting yet another argument between the two. And during this argument, Eichiro told his father that he wanted to kill him. As you can imagine, this was a huge red flag for Hideaki, as just three days prior, 19 people had been severely injured by Ryuichi Iwasaki, and now here was his son threatening him with his own life. With the fearful imagery still branded fresh into his mind, Hideaki made a snap decision during his son's outburst. The old man was going to make sure that his son would never become a mass murderer like Ryuichi, and with Ichiro's anger still erupting, Hideaki made his way to the kitchen, grabbed a knife, and then began to savagely attack his own son, tragically stabbing him repeatedly in the neck and chest. It wasn't until 30 stab wounds later that Hideaki finally seized his attack, walking away and leaving his son to bleed to death on the kitchen floor. It seemed that Hideaki wanted to take accountability for his brutal actions, because at 3.30pm that same afternoon, he dialed the number for the Japanese emergency services to report the murder of his son by his own hand. Paramedics rushed the family home, but sadly, by the time they arrived it was all too late. He had bled out long before he could receive help and was therefore pronounced dead at the scene. Moving to the legal proceedings of this case, but Hideaki would never take any accountability for his actions. Instead, he would even try to justify them by saying that his son had attacked him during an argument. To make things worse, he even claimed it was for the greater good, as he didn't want his son to become the next murderous Ikikomori. But by the time his second trial came around, Hideaki seemed to have a change of heart, because now he only claimed self-defense. This didn't hold water in court however, as there was no evidence or proof to suggest that Hideaki had struggled, or even been physically hurt during the attack. More damning though was the evidence of premeditation to Hideaki's onslaught on his own son. Search histories found on his computer showed that he had been heavily researching the legal repercussions of killing someone in Japan, and also how best to get these charges and sentences deferred or minimised. To really cement his guilt, a letter was found addressed from Hideaki to his wife, stating that his son was beyond all help and the world would be a better place if he were to simply disappear. Faced with the overwhelming evidence, Hideaki stressed that, despite the premeditation, he was extremely remorseful for what he had done to his son, and that he felt that, at the time, he had no other choice. Ultimately, after pleading not guilty in February of 2021 to the murder of his son, Hideaki Kamazawa was found guilty and sentenced to a meager six years in prison. Now, here on Coffeehouse Crime, we've seen some ridiculously short sentences before. But six years for murdering your own son, it honestly leaves me feeling pretty dumbfounded, especially considering the sheer violence showed during the attack. In his mind, Hideaki was convinced with such complete certainty that his son was both capable and able 
to commit the same level of atrocities as Ryuichi. So much so, that it gave him every bit of internal validation and justification to stab him to death in his own home. This was all ultimately based on the flimsy connection of his son being a reclusive shut-in like Ryuichi was, despite other similarities being noticeably absent. There is also the possibility that Hideaki believed he was enacting a noble deed by ridding the world and his family of his problematic son, removing his burdensome existence from their lives. This was never stated by Hideaki, of course, and he likely parroted what his lawyers instructed him to say in court to give him the best chance of a short sentence. Given how successful and senior his position was within the government, there is a distinct possibility that Hideaki felt a sense of shame at Ichiro's perceived lack of any notable success. But for a sentence that short, in my eyes, nothing can really justify it, especially not for the murder of your own son. In the aftermath of the trial, the media didn't take long to link the two cases together, and ran with their new hot topic of recluses and their mental states becoming increasingly unstable as they aged. And given that Hikikomori numbers are only rising as time goes on, the media claimed that soon they will become a genuine danger to society. Shockingly, a vast number of people interviewed after the trial of Hideaki Komazawa wholeheartedly supported his actions, indicating just how despised and shunned Hikikomori are in Japanese society. By the way, this runs in tandem with Japan's very awful views of disabled people. However, there was a small ray of hope following these two cases because after they became widely publicised, there was a substantial increase in people seeking help for themselves or for their loved ones to overcome chronic reclusion and isolation. The Minister for Health in Japan also released a statement, reassuring the population that these events should not be linked inherently with hikikomori. The main point they made is that every individual is different and experiencing different life circumstances. Now, this sentiment is particularly true. Although a small number of folks are shut-ins and choose to sit in their own world of hate, most people simply prefer their own space and privacy. There can be a lot of comfort in being surrounded by your own safe space, and if a person finds this comfortable, they should be allowed to live like this if they choose to. Eichiro may have not been happy with his life, but it was pretty obvious that his mental health was under the influence of far more than just being a reclusive individual. And despite being reclusive to the physical world, his virtual friends in the Dragon Quest Online community made the effort of holding a virtual funeral for him. On his final Twitter post, comments can be seen split from both sides. Some agreed fully with Hideaki's actions, saying that he was fully in the right to have killed his son, and being Hikikomori was justification enough for his father's snap. But on the other side of things, several commentators sent prayers and wishes to Eichiro, offering their condolences and even hoping that in the next life, he would be allowed to be a part of the fictional world that he loved and adored so much. On May the 28th, 2019, Ryuichi's actions initially caused the death of two innocent individuals. But when you look at the case of Iichiro, it could be argued that Ryuichi actually had three innocent victims. It may very well be that, had the events of May not taken place, Hideaki may never have felt the need to reach for the knife. We will likely never fully understand the reasoning and thought process behind his attack on his son, but no matter how you look at it, nothing can ever justify such a senselessly brutal act. Given his ASD diagnosis, Eichiro desperately needed the support early in his life to give him the maximum chance of success. However, in lieu of this, he found his comfort and solace with physical isolation, fulfilling his hyperfixations in the virtual worlds of video games and anime. Heart-wrenchingly, given the type of life that he Led, there aren't a vast number of people around who feel the impact of the loss of Eichiro. But given his online presence, and the love shown towards him after his death on Twitter, there are at least some who will miss him, and will remember him fondly. So, although our next story is more punchy, it comes with another terrible haircut and that's the strange case of Yuka Takeoka. After believing that her so-called boyfriend was cheating on her, she decided to turn against him in February of 2019. Speaking of actions and reactions, hers were not the gentlest and the slightest. Either way, from this point forward, she would be known as the real-life Yandere. Our short story starts in Tokyo, Japan. It was October 2018, and 21-year-old Yuka Takeoki resided in Shinjuku City. Shinjuku is a special district in Tokyo, known for its buzzing clubs, karaoke rooms, and upscale restaurants, all of them shrouded by skyscrapers. Yuka was living an alternate life, or at least by Western standards. She dropped out of university at the age of 19 to become the manager of a hostess club in Shinjuku. 
Hostess clubs are popular in the nightlife industry of East Asian countries, typically hiring female employees to serve drinks and provide thoughtful conversation to male customers. And Yuka was also a fan of anime, a style of Japanese animation typically aimed for both adults and children. She was so much of a fan, in fact, that she would often post pictures of herself dressing up and cosplaying as some of her favourite characters on her Twitter and Instagram pages, still up to this date. She was a quietly shy individual, the type of person who initially wouldn't say much, but grew confidence the more she knew you. Generally laid back and sweet, not the type you'd expect any problems from. Back to anime. One of her favourite types of cosplays was of yandere characters, a specific type of personality. Yanderes are generally kind, nurturing and lovable women, ones of which that eventually turn violent and possessive over a love interest. Can you see where this is going? In October that year, while still working at a hostess bar, she met a 20-year-old man named Phoenix Luna. He was also a host at a nearby host bar called Fusion Nightclub. Host bars are the same as hostess bars, just hiring male employees for female customers. And Phoenix Luna was in a game of his own. He was very popular amongst the hosts in Shinjuku, and often was in the bar's leaderboards, a lot of his female patrons often returning for his bartending services. Now just to point out, this is all safe for work. Host bars and hostess bars are strictly PG. At least officially. Other than having things in common, Yuka and Phoenix were in the same industry. They understood each other well from a professional point of view. And with their late night work schedules matching, it meant that they had a lot of time out of working hours to connect as friends. It was due to these reasons over the following weeks and months that the two grew closer to each other, and eventually started dating. The relationship wasn't all fine and dandy though. Although their matching hours gave them more time to see each other, it also created some tension between the two. With Yuka and Phoenix both working in the same industry, one designed to generate money through flirting, it posed and bared a risk for the Green Devil. Jealousy. And oh boy, did that work for Yuka. Over the following months, she grew more and more possessive over him, often monitoring his whereabouts and even checking on his phone when he wasn't looking. She grew so ever increasingly jealous over Phoenix that eventually she, she outright bought his services from the bar paying over $9,000 a month, just so he wouldn't see any other women. A little bit strange, don't you think? Fast forward, and it is now May the 23rd, 2019, a few months after the two had started dating. Things were going pretty well for the two, and despite a few tensions here and there, the two were happy. Yuka was still managing the hostess bar, and business was solid. She'd taken a couple days off of work to sort some things out in the apartment. She'd asked Phoenix to drop by her house to help with some DIY, in which he agreed. He'd arrived at her home much later than expected though, it was a very long shift at the bar that night, and when he got in he was exhausted. He asked Yuka if he could run himself a bath to relax, in which she agreed. One he got into, and then fell asleep in. During that time though, Yuka had once again snooped through her boyfriend's phone and while doing so she found a few photos of him with another woman. She didn't know who she was, and it couldn't be a client because she'd bought him out. This discovery enraged Yuka. She'd noticed for the last couple days that he'd been distant with her. She put that together with these photos, and took it as evidence that he was cheating on her. So how would you confront your partner if you were suspicious over a picture? Discuss any problems in the relationship? Ask if everything's okay? Not for Yuka. That's not how she rolled. After waking up in the bath, Phoenix put on some underwear. He then crept into the bedroom and slid into the bed, trying not to wake Yuka who was supposedly already asleep. And because he was so already exhausted from all of his shifts the last few days, he passed out pretty much immediately. Some time had passed when all of a sudden Phoenix felt an uncomfortable feeling coming from his stomach. He looked down and that's when he saw a knife lodged into his abdomen. Waking up in surprise and terror, he looked back up to see Yuka arched over him. Is this real? Am I dreaming? He thought. Running on pure adrenaline, he shoved her off the bed and ran out the room. Yuka chased Phoenix, grabbing him as he left the front door. Him being taller though, he was stronger and pushed her away as he reached the elevator. By now, Phoenix was losing a lot of blood. The elevator door was closing, and it was heading towards the ground floor. 
and as the elevator door opened up to the lobby, he lunged forward, almost to safety, and then lost consciousness. Yukud caught up with Phoenix. He lay collapsed on the floor of the hotel lobby, blood pooling around his body. By now, passers-by had noticed the horrific scene unfolding, and the police, they'd called them immediately. But Yuka, she wouldn't leave his side. She just sat there next to his body, and people were too scared to get close to them in case she did something back. And the following picture is what has made this case notorious. When they got there, police found Yuka sat next to his body, drenched in his blood, casually smoking a cigarette while on the phone to her friend. In the time it had taken police to get there, she'd also written a letter with his blood, repeatedly saying I love you over and over and over again. Tokyo Metropolitan Police apprehended Yuka immediately. They would find the letter that she wrote along with the knife she'd used to stab Phoenix in her apartment. When the officer had asked her why she did it, she replied with, I was sad and seeking to die. I thought that if I kill him, I could be with him. I thought that expressions such as I like you and I would like to be with you would become reality if we both died. Numerous witnesses watched as police escorted Yuka into the back of their vehicle, and when she got in there, she was smiling. And as for the victim, Phoenix Luna, he was still alive, but only barely. Following the speed in which police and paramedics had got to the apartments, he had not yet passed from his injuries. He was transported to a local hospital where he remained in critical condition, with only a 20% chance to survive. But on July the 1st, an entire month after he was stabbed in the abdomen, to everyone's surprise, Phoenix Luna was alive and recovering. He tweeted friends and fans to say, sorry, I'm alive and back, before adding, since I was stabbed in the liver, I can't drink. Being a survivor of a horrific experience, Phoenix agreed to attending a local interview, and in that interview he refused to show any hate towards Yuka. When asked, he said that I do not hold a grudge. He even pleaded with the judge to reduce her sentence. On Thursday the 5th of December 2019, the presiding judge sentenced Yuka to three years and six months for attempted mu- Did I get that right? Yup, three years and six months. On Thursday the 5th of December 2019, the presiding judge handed Yuka a prison term of three years and six months for attempted murder. Yuka and Phoenix previously had made a court settlement for her to pay him 5 million yen, the equivalent of 47,000 US dollars, as a means to reduce her time behind bars. At her hearing, the court judge declared, if possible, I want people to be able to lead a normal life rather than paying for their sins. And the story doesn't end there. Following Yuka's attempted murder and imprisonment, she grew an entire online community of fans, most of which are invested in anime culture that possess a deep admiration for her, hailing her as if she were a real-life yandere. Her fans believed that she didn't need to be condemned for her actions, only rehabilitated. She even had a GoFundMe-style campaign raised for her, and while the campaign was shut down, at the time she was receiving over $3,800 from 69 contributors, almost the amount needed to get her out of prison. Following Yuka's crime of attempted murder, she is now scheduled to be released from prison in May 2023. With this case happening in 2019, and Yuka only receiving three years, it is crazy to think that she is now back in the real world. Hopefully she has addressed whatever mental health issues she was experiencing. And as for Phoenix, I admire his forgiveness. Now, our next story is absolutely tragic, and if you're an anime fan, you've likely heard this one before already but this is the story of Shinji Aoba. With vibrant skylines, modern architecture, and supreme infrastructure, Kyoto has a bit of everything. Something that many companies and corporations would look for when settling an office. And one of those companies was Kyoto Animation. Originally founded in 1981 by Hideaki Hata and his wife Yoko, Kyoto Animation has thrived from humble beginnings as a small production services company into one of Japan's most successful studios. Over the years, Kyoto Animation became recognized for its high production values and its sensitivity to the wonders and quandaries of ordinary life. Unlike most studios, they also paid their employees in salary, rather than freelance contract. They would also train their employees in-house, thus encouraging them to focus on quality rather than quota. Kyoto Animation grew as a company over the decades, eventually moving from its head office in Uji City to Fushimi-ku in Kyoto, their new site affectionately named Studio One. 
They would go on to create popular anime titles such as Clanad, K-On! and A Silent Voice. By the year of 2019, Kyoto Animation was thriving. They were well known not just for their products, but for their business practice too. But, as with all types of fame, all that positive attention will come with a slice of negativity too. I mean sure, some would simply just find Kyoto Animation's work boring. Some would even find a way to dislike their business model. But what I'm talking about is a very small minority. The type that would find personal hatred out of nothing. And one of those individuals would go by the name of Shinji Aoba. In 2019, Shinji Aoba was a 40-year-old man who lived in Saitama. He was born on the 16th of May 1978. He grew up in Midoriku, a ward in Saitama City. When he was a child though, his parents would divorce, and this would leave him with his father, brother and sister. Shinji lived a troubled life into adulthood. His classmates would describe him as absent and often irate. After he graduated, he became a part-time clerk at a convenience store. After that though, at the age of 34, Shinji would run into trouble with the law. It was June 2012, and he robbed a convenience store with a knife. He would gain 20,000 yen, or $200 from it, but he would eventually get caught. Police sentenced Shinji to three and a half years in prison. At his trial, he would tell prosecutors that he was sick of living in a society. He was eventually released in 2016, where he moved back into an apartment in Saitama City. Back in Kyoto, Kyoto Animation was growing from strength to strength through the years. And since 2009, Kyoto Animation had been hosting an annual competition called the Kyoto Animation Awards. They would host this competition to connect with their audience and offer exposure to talented writers, where contestants could submit their stories to Kyoto Animation for review. The selected winning stories to this competition would be published under the company's imprint, and, if they're lucky, would later have a chance to be adapted into an anime. The award itself is prestigious, and with 1 million yen or $10,000 up for grabs, it's fiercely competitive too. And this is where Kyoto Animation and Shinji Aoba first crossed paths. Because between the years of 2017 and 2018, Shinji would submit his story to Kyoto Animation, twice. Anime is very commonly watched in Japan, so much that it's predicted that about 35% of its population watches it more than once a week. And for Shinji, he was very heavily in that category. Being a stay-at-home kind of guy, he would heavily absorb himself into anime and gaming pretty much every day of the year. His submissions to Kyoto Animation would not go very far though. Unfortunately, they were formally eliminated by judges in the first round. The numerous rejections disappointed Shinji, they angered him, in fact. But the grudge against Kyoto Animation would only start here. And Shinji's troubled mind would only grow worse too. Since his release from prison, Shinji was growing further isolated from friends and family. In fact, he almost had none. In 1999, his father committed suicide, and since then, he'd cut all contact with his brother and sister too. It was clear that by 2018, Shinji seemed resentful to the world, antisocial. With no family or friends to love, he became bitter. And with the only interactions with people around him being his neighbours, they were becoming violent too. In late 2018, after his stories had already been rejected by Kyoto Animation, Shinji was an unstable man. But there would be one new detail to his life, which would set him down his darkest path. He was in his home one evening watching more anime, and the anime it was made by Kyoto Animation. In his deluded and isolated mindset though, he made a connection. The connection was that actually what he had just been watching, it seemed way too familiar. In fact, it was his story, the story he submitted in the contest last year. Kyoto Animation, they'd stolen from him. This outraged Shinji, and Kyoto Animation, they were going to hear about it. Around the same time in October, staff would wake up one morning to over 200 death threats via email, all sent to various employees across the business, the sender using anonymized software to withhold their identity. The police were contacted, but since these emails were fired out using Tor, it was impossible to find out who the sender was. Maybe we can take a guess though. Instead, police patrols were temporarily deployed around the building, and while the death threats stopped, Vengeance would soon be made in a much more sinister way the following year.
Sunday the 14th of July 2019. Nine months had passed, but Shinji's life, it was still the same. It was the weekend, and Matsumoto, a 27-year-old quality control engineer, was enjoying his weekend on the couch. Matsumoto, or Matsu and Shinji, were neighbours, and unfortunately for the two of them, another neighbour upstairs was assembling furniture. Shinji though, he thought it was Matsu. The two often complained at each other over noise. Usually though, Shinji was the loud one. Shinji started to bang on the shared wall between his and Matsu's apartments. Matsu, being the courteous guy, walked up to Shinji's front door to tell him that the noise it wasn't him. Shinji opened his front door, and he grabbed Matsu by the collar of his shirt, before shouting at him. You're too loud, shut up. I'm going to kill you. I have nothing to lose. Shinji would eventually let go of Matsu, and Matsu, who was too scared to stay at home, walked down to the police station to report the assault. By the time police would get to Shinji's house though to confront him, he was gone. And where he'd gone to, was anyone's guess. By the next day, Shinji had taken the Shinkansen bullet train to Tokyo, and checked in at a local downtown hotel. And the next morning, on July the 16th, Shinji travelled to Kyoto. CCTV cameras captured him at various points along the way. One at an internet cafe south of Kyoto Station. That night, he stayed in another nearby hotel. On Wednesday the 17th of July, still wearing the same jeans and red t-shirt that he'd worn for the last three days, Shinji walked into a hardware store and bought himself a metal trolley. He then wheeled the trolley six miles north, before stopping at an Aeneas gas station to purchase ten gallons of gasoline. Shinji then travelled with his trolley full of gasoline along Uji River, towards Kyoto Animation's studio. He would stop at the night for a hotel, and the plans he had in store for tomorrow would be nothing short of evil. On Thursday the 18th of July 2019, Shinji arrived at Kyoto Animation Studio, with the cart full of gasoline. The time was 10.31am, and some 70 employees were inside, working away. That is when Shinji pushed through the building's front doors, he toppled over one of the buckets of the gasoline. He then flicked a lighter and screamed, You will die. Within 10 seconds of ignition, the bucket of gasoline had exploded, setting the building's first floor entirely alight. And within another 10 seconds, the second floor was fully ablaze too. Windows on the third floor were destroyed within one minute of the blast, black smoke bellowing out from every open hole that it could find. Shinji Aoba was still alive, but considering he set the canister alight, and that exploded less than 10 seconds later, he was on fire. He ran out of the building, before collapsing in a street nearby. Passersby, unaware of who the monster was, quickly treated Shinji for his injuries. He would very quickly regain consciousness. As soon as he did, he clambered to his feet and tried to run away. However, two people from Kyoto Animation recognised him. They chased after him, and then barraged him to the ground. That is when police intervened and they caught up with him. When they found out who he was, and they asked him why he did it, Shinji shouted, They plagiarised my work. I demand to speak to the company president. Firefighters were quick to the scene, but the fate of half of the people inside had already been determined. The fire would continue to burn without mercy for five long hours. Rescue workers would eventually find the bodies of 33 employees late that evening. Three on the first floor, 11 on the second floor, and 19 on the spiral staircase to the roof, of which the door had failed to open from inside, the staircase acting as a giant funnel to fuel the fire. Dozens more that were in the building at the time of the attack would be treated for their injuries but, unfortunately, over the following weeks, three more would die to their wounds, bringing the total death toll to 36. Japan was in total shock after the attack. As news of the fire became more obviously evil, the nation, the world, and the anime community all looked on in anger and despair. Shinji Aoba would become the assailant to one of the nation's largest acts of mass murder since the end of World War II. 
As firefighters tended to Shinji on the streets, police would discover that he actually had a plan B. They found six unused knives, probably to be used if his arsonist plan failed to work. And despite the several witnesses putting Shinji as the main suspect, the six unused knives found on his persona, and soon CCTV footage showing him at various locations with a cart full of gasoline, Kyoto police were not able to formally arrest the man. He had suffered severe burns across his entire body, injuring himself so badly that he was unconscious. And although police had a warrant for his arrest, they were unable to formally do that until medical examination certified that he would be fit to survive in a detention facility. Shinji was actually given a 1% chance to live, and as the days turned into weeks, he was still unconscious after the attack. And miraculously, or unfortunately, depending which way you look at it, Shinji would survive his injuries. In September 2019, doctors would certify that he was no longer in a life-threatening condition. There was a lack of human skin available for grafting though, as organ donation is rare in Japan. So officials made the right decision to give the victims priority to receive donor skin before Shinji. And that donor would never arrive, as Shinji became the first person in Japan to get a fully artificial skin graft. Police would eventually be able to start questioning Shinji in September 2019, and it was then that he confirmed again that yes, he was the arsonist to the attack. He would then go on to say, I had a grudge against Kyoto Animation. I thought that if I sprayed gasoline around the building while setting the fire, I could kill more people. So that's why I did that. It was in May 2020 that Shinji was declared fit enough for arrest, 10 months after the attack. By this time though, the world had started spiralling into a pandemic. The story of Shinji Aruba would slowly trundle on, but without the international attention it once received. He was formally arrested on the 27th of May 2020, and by December 2020 he was formally charged too, the 42-year-old undeniably guilty of his crimes. He would confirm the reason for his rage is that he felt Kyoto Animation had stolen one of his ideas, and they'd used it in one of their anime without crediting or compensating him. He said, The thing Kyoto Animation copied from me was the scene in Tsurune, where the main characters buy discounted meat. According to reports, the scene is vastly generic, and Kyoto Animation, they deny plagiarising anything from the man. The days following the studio massacre, Kyoto Animation initially stated that they were not aware of any contest entries by Shinji, but during a more thorough examination, they discovered that he had indeed submitted his own novel. This would again highlight though that his novel had been rejected in the first round of judgments and scrapped from the company's awareness. A year and a half after the attack, a six-month psychological evaluation on Shinji's mental health had ended, and the conclusion was that yes, Shinji, he knew what he was doing when he lit the fire, he was mentally coherent. This paves the way for Shinji to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, and with Japan accepting the death penalty in certain circumstances, and this being one of the worst mass murders in over 70 years time, it's not looking very good for Shinji. Kyoto Animation also shared that they expect Shinji to be prosecuted to the maximum extent under Japanese law. Shinji's terrible actions left a scar on the anime community, with 36 deaths and a further 34 injuries. In recent news though, he has since been found guilty, and as of last month, has been sentenced to death. So, for this compilation, let's dive into one final video. And although this begins in the UK, it ends in a Japanese millionaire's home. Our story today begins in the southeast of England. Welcome to Kent. There's a lot of history in this part of the UK, but now Kent's economy is primarily focused upon services. Known as the Garden of England, Kent is full to the brim of old cathedrals and castles, but recently it's building itself a reputation for its food and wine. Found towards the western border of Kent lies a small town named Seven Oaks, and here lived Lucy Blackman. Lucy was born on September the 1st, 1978, to her mother Jane and father Tim Blackman. Lucy was the oldest of three siblings, and her younger sister Sophie and younger brother Rupert completed the family of five. But sadly, her parents would divorce in the middle of Lucy's childhood, and throughout this separation, Lucy, along with her mother, brother and sister, would find themselves moving to Kent. Lucy was described as a very happy child, always full of energy and forthright with positivity. She was a meticulous planner, and this served her well in school. Following her graduation from school, Lucy made the decision to become a flight attendant for British Airways, a job which, obviously, would allow her to fly all over the world. 
but over the following couple years, she had grown exhausted from the constant travel and work. And with many of these jobs not paying very well, this left Lucy short on money. And as a result, she spiralled into a small debt. Like many of us going through her first job, it was in this moment of exhaustion that Lucy began to question her choice in career and direction. Lucy loved to travel, and although her job with British Airways was relatively good, it wasn't doing her any favours financially or for her mental health. This was when Lucy and one of her friends and colleagues, Louise, hatched up a plan. Travelling didn't have to be hopping from one country to another every week. They could settle in one foreign location, find a good job, and earn good money. The two flight attendants had always liked the look of Japan, a country which is seriously like no other. Being home to more than a dozen UNESCO World Heritage Sites, Japan's traditions and principles run deep throughout the country. Add its food, modern technology, and sprawling suburban lifestyle to the mix, and you're only just touching the surface. With this interest in mind, Lucy and Louise decided to leave their jobs at British Airways and instead find a job in Japan to repay their debts. The idea was nerve-wracking, but they had each other. And so, with that said, they purchased their tickets, headed over to Heathrow Airport, and boarded their flight to Japan. In May of the year 2000, Lucy and Louise found themselves in the heart of Tokyo. Settling for an apartment near Roppongi, a district well known for its nightlife and western culture, they spread out to find a job. And soon after that, they came back with an offer. They began to work at one of the local nightclubs called Casablanca, where they became hostesses to its many patrons. Among many other aspects, Japan has its own way of doing things when compared to the western world. And host and hostess clubs, also known as Kyabakura, fall into this category. Hostesses are paid to light cigarettes, provide drinks, converse and perhaps flirt with their customers. This may include karaoke, but it's worth mentioning that dancing, stripping and anything otherwise are generally banned in kebakuras. It's a place for businessmen or women to relax and enjoy themselves, all within a PG atmosphere. And particularly in Roppongi, many of these bars sought to hire western women for their Japanese patrons. The pay was fine and they both had good experience in public customer service. How hard could it be anyway? As part of Casablanca Club's rules, all hostesses are encouraged to meet their customers for dinner prior to bringing them to the club where their shift would begin. And this kind of dinner date is known as a dohan in Japan. Lucy's parents were concerned about their daughter's choice in work, but she was confident and made it very clear that she knew her limits. She described the job as still being an air hostess, but without the altitude. July the 1st, 2000. In the warm Saturday afternoon, Lucy slipped on her sandals and black dress as she made her way to the front door. Seeing her friend Louise in the adjacent room, she explained that she was going on a dohan with a customer from the Casablanca club. She said he'd offered her a new mobile phone in return, and the date would only be an hour long at a restaurant near the beach. Louise understood, she told Lucy not to take too long as the girls had plans late that evening. Her boyfriend Scott Fraser was also in the area, and the three of them were looking forward to the weekend plans. Lucy would message Louise three times later that day. Her first message sent at 1.30pm said, I am now with my lunch date. And at 5pm, she sent Louise another text message to say, I am being taken to the sea. And finally, at around 6.45pm, she sent her third and final text message, I'll be back in half an hour. This same text message was sent to Scott a few minutes later. But as the clock struck 8pm, Lucy still hadn't returned home. And as Tokyo slipped further into the night, Lucy remained unaccounted for. Despite having evening plans, telling her friend and her boyfriend that she was on her way, no one had seen or heard from Lucy. Quite simply, she had vanished. What do you do when your friend disappears in a foreign city? And not just any foreign city, but the capital of Japan. With the greater Tokyo area holding a population of 34.4 million residents, finding a needle in a haystack would be much easier. Adding unfamiliarity to the country's language, law and practices, and you're now in very uncomfortable territory. Louise contacted local police, but they didn't seem too interested. And as Saturday crawled into Sunday and then into Monday, there were still no signs of Lucy. No one at the club had seen her, and all phone calls and text messages to her mobile were seemingly ignored. But then suddenly, in the evening of Monday the 3rd of July, Louise received a phone call. It was from a man with a thick Japanese accent. He spoke English well, but slowly. He said, Lucy can't talk at the moment. Lucy is okay, but she isn't coming home. She has joined a newly risen cult. She is safe and training in Hutton Chiba. 
Back at home in England, and Lucy's mother Jane had just been made aware of Lucy's disappearance, and her reaction was swift and violent. From the very moment that she knew her daughter was missing, she was terrified. The anonymous call was concerning in its own right, but it was also extremely out of character for Lucy to just vanish without saying anything. Just the very next morning, Lucy's sister Sophie and her ex-boyfriend Jamie were now on a flight to Tokyo, and the challenge they now faced before themselves was both expansive and daunting. Although a missing persons report had been filed, police were very lethargic to look into Lucy's case, and over the following days, working with authorities was both cumbersome and frustrating. They simply didn't care. They exclaimed that she was an adult free to do whatever she wants, and quite frankly, it wasn't their problem. At the time, police effort was very poor. Lucy's silence could mean a life or death situation. Not to add to her family's extreme anxieties, but time really was of the essence. They realised they were not going to get anywhere with this current momentum, and so, as a result, they directed their attention towards the media instead. Perhaps if Lucy's case publicly blew up, it would garner tips and information, and finally kick local police into action. Making public appearances in front of the Japanese press nurtured strong results, and over the following days, Lucy's disappearance grew in notoriety and attention. The Japanese public started to weigh in and help. Many tips came through to the new private hotline, and although this sounded encouraging, there were a lot of red herrings. And as Lucy's family approached the two-week mark, both anxiety and aspiration started to boil. By now, both English and Japanese media were obsessed with the case, even Prime Minister Tony Blair and Virgin's Richard Branson making appeals to the public, and this put a lot of pressure on Japanese police. By the end of the third week, a handwritten letter had made its way to the police. This note was apparently written by Lucy, in which she said she was okay and didn't want to be contacted. However, this signature was proven to be forged. Somebody out there was playing games with the police. In parallel to this, Lucy's family made the decision to hire a private investigator from England, and being assigned the job, he flew over to Tokyo immediately. He began to prowl the streets of Roppongi and Ginza, and eventually he found his way to Club Casablanca. While he was here, one of the other Western hostesses came forward. She admitted seeing Lucy with another man in the nights before she disappeared. So, maybe he knew something. Using his contacts from Scotland Yard back in the UK, this private investigator had an artist impression created from the given description, which in return created this profile image. And as Lucy's disappearance spread like wildfire, multiple Western women would eventually come forward. All of them gave very concerning stories of their experience with a man thought to be the same person in this profile image and as one account turned into several, a very worrying pattern emerged. In each and every case, this man would take the young woman on a dohan, promising them money and luxurious gifts before luring them back to his apartment, and after arriving, he would spike their drink and assault them. Although the name of this man varied from victim to victim, his appearance did not. He was described to be a middle-aged man. He had medium-length hair for a man, and he was handsome, charming, and visibly rich. The collected accounts of several young women when combined with the police sketch was encouraging news to investigators, it gave them a definitive lead to work towards. However, despite this, no new discoveries were made, and as Lucy's disappearance slipped from weeks into months, many started to doubt if they would ever hear from her again. As time goes by, both the public and media attention tend to grow less interested in a missing persons case, and realistically, so does the opportunity to collect evidence. Surveillance tapes get written over, fingerprints are weathered away, and people's memories of the day begin to fade. It was beginning to look less and less likely that this case would ever be solved. When suddenly, in the fourth month of police investigation, officers made a breakthrough. As October rolled around, a prime suspect had at long last been identified. The man's name was Joji Ibarra. He was known to frequent Casablanca Club, but always under a different name. Nevertheless, he perfectly fit the description given by multiple victims. Born on August the 10th, 1952, Joji Ibarra came from a hard-working family. Hard work that, for his father, turned into fortune. His father was a Korean immigrant. He moved to Japan as a young adult with no money but big dreams. His tenacity and hard work ethic served him very well. He may have begun his career as a scrap collector, but by the time he and his wife gave birth to Joji, he was extremely wealthy. Building an empire through taxi companies, pachinko parlors, and real estate business. Along with his two brothers, Joji earned himself a reputation as the stereotypical rich kid at school. He was often protected by his father's wealth, and by the time he enrolled into Keio Senior High School in Kanagawa, his father rewarded him with a house. Unfortunately, at the age of 17, his father sadly passed away, 
leaving Joji and his two brothers over 40 million yen in assets across Osaka and Tokyo. The equivalent to 25 million pounds, or 33 million dollars. After graduating from Keio University with a degree in politics and law, he became a naturalized Japanese citizen, with his brothers moving on to become doctors. But progressing into his 30s, Joji found his everyday job to be tedious and boring. It was around this time, from 1986 to 1991, that Japan experienced an economic bubble, meaning that the real estate and stock market prices began to rocket. Joji heavily invested into this, believing that prices would continue to indefinitely rise. But in the early months of 1992, this bubble burst, causing real estate prices to plunge and Japan's economy to stagnate. He lost the risk, and as a result his firm collapsed, his fortune almost entirely gone. But he wasn't out of the fight yet. Instead, he began to use his company as a money laundering front for the Yakuza, also known as the Japanese Mafia. So as soon as Joji was recognized as the man in the police sketch, officers began to build a case around him, and of course keep him under close observation. And finally, in early October, he was officially arrested and charged on five counts of indecent assault, therefore allowing officers to raid and investigate his property. What they found inside was devastating. He had a large library full of videos of himself taking advantage of his drugged victims with some of these crimes dating back all the way to the early 90s. He had been committing these awful acts of violence for almost an entire decade. Despite police findings and victim accusations, Joji denied all acts of violence and also denied ever meeting Lucy. This is on the contrary to multiple reports placing him in the same bar as her only days prior to her disappearance. With Joji behind bars, but as evidence mostly circumstantial, Lucy's family needed more information to feel comfortable that he was Lucy's suspect. Off the back of this, an international appeal was launched to ask anyone who may have had experience with Joji Ibarra to come forward. And this would strike a chord with an Australian man. Eight years earlier, in February of 1992, he was in love with a woman named Karita Ridgway. In fact, they were engaged, looking forward to spend the rest of their lives together. But things didn't quite turn out that way. Karita was an aspiring actress, but with her dream of making it big, she needed money to attend acting school. And I'm sorry if you can see where this is going. Karita decided to pay for her tuition by becoming a hostess in Tokyo's Kyabakuras, and as part of this agreement, she would go on dohans. On February the 27th, 1992, Karita attended a dohan with a rich Japanese man, but after this date, she was dropped off unconscious. Karita was rushed to hospital, in which doctors did the very best they could to save her, but tragically, two days later, she died of liver failure. The cause of her death was officially deemed to be hepatitis E or natural causes, but this idea never felt plausible to her family or boyfriend. Karita was a healthy woman, she had no concerning medical history, and she was always clean. The boyfriend contacted Japanese authorities, who in return reopened Karita's case with a sharp focus to link her with Joji Ibarra, and the conclusion they were looking for came very quickly. Amongst the 400 videotapes found in Joji's home was one named Karita Ridgway. And in his diary on February the 27th, 1992, he had written, Karita Ridgway, too much chloroform. As tragic as this development was, this information was all that police needed to upgrade Joji's charges from assault to murder. And although this fresh evidence was successful in strengthening his role in Lucy's disappearance, it sadly didn't confirm it. But then, in January of 2001, six months after Lucy had vanished, a very sad and solemn discovery was made. On January the 10th, 2001, investigations led police to a cave off the shores of Miura in Kanagawa, and this cave was only 100 meters away from Joji's apartment. While here, they noticed uneven concrete underneath the basin of a bathtub. Rather puzzled, they began to remove the concrete, and what they found underneath were a series of packages. They slowly opened these packages up, and tragically, inside each of them were dismembered body parts, with even the head entombed in concrete. When post-mortem examiners cut into the cement, they hoped to find teeth to match with dental records, but instead, they immediately found one identifiable feature. It was long, natural blonde hair. As you can probably guess, the body was later confirmed to belong to Lucy Blackman. Lucy's family were devastated. The long spell of silence from their daughter already painted a very grave reality for her, but they always held on to the hope that maybe one day she would return, and this discovery would put an end to their hopes. The discovery of Lucy's body would ignite a very long, exhausting legal battle between Joji Ibarra and not just the family of Lucy and Karita, but the family of many other victims too. 
Joji had now been charged with nine counts of indecent assault, the murder of Krita Ridgway, and now the murder of Lucy Blackman too. But he would still deny having anything to do with Lucy's death, and this was despite her body being found not even two minutes from his apartment. Joji admitted that he'd spent the evening with her, but insisted that shortly after 5pm, she had left the apartment. Apparently she was high, and therefore he asked her to leave. The entire trial would last almost seven long years, which was full of disappointing spectacles by Joji. In one of his days in courts, he refused to leave his jail cell, and instead he stripped naked, held onto his toilet basin, and repeatedly screamed no. There is some extremely frustrating evidence coming up, but before that I wanted to share with you that Joji was found not guilty of the murder of Lucy Blackman, which makes the following details all the more enraging. Through the multitudes of analysis, investigators were able to confirm the following. At around 4pm on July the 1st, 2000, Lucy met up with Joji. An hour later, she rang Louise to say that they were on their way to the coast. Mobile phone data confirms this. At 5.30pm, a Japanese couple saw Joji and Louise together at a seaside resort. And a photo from a camera from Joji's flat confirms that they were on the beach shortly after. Blonde hairs belonging to Lucy were found in his flat, and this was confirmed by DNA analysis. Mobile phone records confirmed that Lucy made her final call in the evening while in his home. This was confirmed by triangulating her mobile phone's coordinates. Copies of her forged signature were found in his apartment, proving that he was the fraudster who had pretended to be her through a letter. We don't quite know what happened later this evening, but the very next day on July the 2nd, phone records show that Joji had called several hospitals in his area asking how to treat someone who's experienced a drug overdose. The very next day, on July the 3rd, receipts confirm that Joji purchased a chainsaw, cement mix, and other tools from a hardware store. And later that afternoon, police were called by Joji's neighbour who'd complained about suspicious activity and noise, as, apparently, they had heard terrified shouting the day prior. It gets even more suspicious. Police reports indicate that later that afternoon, officers arrived at Joji's apartment to request that they look around. Upon entering, they found that he had cement mix on his hands, and he was visibly shaken. When police requested to look in his bathroom, he became aggressive and refused to let them in, instead exclaiming that they'd already seen enough. The police left without pressing this issue any further. Neighbours reported that later in the evening on the same day, they witnessed Joji pacing the small beach next to his apartment several times, and hospital records show that he was treated for extensive bug bites the next day as a result for being outside all night. However, despite the text messages, phone calls, witness reports, police reports, forged signature, mobile phone data, DNA, previous cases, and bug bites, he was still found innocent over Lucy's murder. Granted, he was found guilty on nine counts of indecent assault and the murder of Carita Ridgway, therefore sentencing him to life, but really? The reason for this is the prosecutor couldn't find any of his DNA on her body, and also they couldn't determine the cause of her death, so technically he was dismissed. And thankfully, one year later after being appealed, Joji was retrialed on the murder of Lucy Blackman, where he was finally found guilty. But seriously, this should have happened the first time around. At least to me, but this case highlights the sheer incompetence of Japan's former police force. I know in recent years they've reformed to become more compassionate and responsive, but back then they really didn't care about their tourists. A few side notes from this case. But while Joji was under trial and not yet found guilty, he offered Lucy's mother condolence money, formally requesting her to stop the trial for £450,000. Understandably, she refused, but only days later, her ex-husband, which is Lucy's father, took the money instead. Obviously, this caused a massive rift in the family, and I'll let you be the judge on how moral this was to his own daughter. Joji's case is unique. He truly is a deviant and a monster to the highest degree. He assaulted not one, but hundreds of women, and technically became a killer through his own ventures. And despite over 99% of Japan's murderers confessing once caught, he remains as part of the 1% who refuses to accept responsibility and blame. Joji Ibarra is a chronic liar who denies any accountability, and obviously he is used to getting everything he desires. Who knows how many more women he would have terrorised if it wasn't for the tenacity and strong will of Lucy's family and friends. All of which, even 22 years later, continue to live their lives with a hole in their heart. And so concludes the case of Joji Ibarra. The crazy thing is, it feels like I recorded that video only yesterday, when actually that was the one to pull me over 1 million subscribers. Anyway folks, I hope you enjoyed this compilation, and personally, I find it very interesting to revisit old stories. Although Japan has some of the most insane stories imaginable, it is an incredibly safe, polite, and beautiful place to be. 
and if you ever have a chance to visit, I thoroughly recommend going. Anyway folks, thank you so much for being here, I really do appreciate it. And as always, I'll see you again very soon for another one. If you haven't subscribed yet, then please consider doing so, it really does help me out. And also, please check out my own coffee, Classified, for some deliciously vibrant coffee. And also, I post a lot of content about true crime, coffee, and Nero on my Instagram. So, if you want to be part of the Coffee House Circle, please check me out there too. Anyway folks, thank you so much for making it this far, and as always, see you again very soon for another one. Until then, look out for yourselves, and each other. Thank you, and goodbye.